Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. everybody, welcome to another episode of Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali A. Rizvi, and with me is Armin Navabi. Armin Navabi is the founder of Atheist Republic, the largest online platform for atheists in the world, with 1.8 million members now and counting. Um, Hello. Armin, uh, I, I can't welcome you to the show because you're, you're, a, you're a fellow host. So Yes, this is always, uh, you always you. make this very awkward. Yeah. <laughs> This is, but it's so much fun. You're you're so cute when you're awkward. <laughs> uh, okay. Now let's let's let, let an awkward silence. But okay, never mind. Okay, let's go on. Um. Uh, so today, uh, we're we have a um our guest today. Uh, his name is Asad Ali Al Andalusi, and it's Asad for short. Uh, that's what we agreed on. He also goes by Ali, but since we already have an Ali on the show, that's me. I called first dibs on that because it's my show. Uh. So. Um, Asad, welcome. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, and Asad, I'm just going to, uh, just a little bit about you. Um, you are the founder of the Andalusian Project, which is an independent research platform for counter-Islamophobia studies. You hold degrees in both Western and Islamic philosophy, and you're currently pursuing your PhD in Islamic studies. Your education has been both in uh, Malaysia and in the United States, and you're currently U.S.-based. Um, he specializes in topics, <clears throat> excuse me, related to the philosophy of science, atheism, terrorism, Islamic political thought and ethics, and other issues surrounding the global Muslim community. So, one one of the things that happened was that uh, you chose to identify as a fundamentalist Muslim, uh, which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting. And I have a little bit of a backstory uh, about that too, from uh, personal experience for myself uh, when I was sort of dabbling in the faith. Uh, but I, I'd love to hear your perspective on that to start. So why would you? Why did you identify as a fundamentalist Muslim? Well, um, I think the word fundamentalist is, is often used in the pejorative sense, and I like to use it in more of a neutral sense as following the fundamentals of my faith. I don't like being called a moderate or an extremist um, because I feel that moderate Muslim is, is also a pejorative for less practicing. So what I'm trying to do by utilizing the term fundamentalist is to kind of take away the pejorative meaning and to showcase that Islamic thought at its fundamental level is not associated with extremist ideas. Um, and another thing about you is that you actually came to Islam voluntarily. So you're not, you weren't born in a Muslim family. Uh, you converted to Islam uh, so this is kind of interesting because obviously the majority of Muslims in the world are Muslim primarily because they were born into Muslim families. Uh, but you chose to come to the faith, which is why we thought that you'd be great to have as a guest. We could really talk about the ideas because um, you seem familiar with them um, quite a lot. We are definitely going to disagree. Um, mm -hmm. I think Armin agrees with that. Armin agrees that we're going to disagree. Armin <laughs> agrees with me. Okay, this is getting weird. Anyway, um, so can you tell us a little bit about, so, so what was it? Uh, what is your sort of um, autobiography in the sense that uh, that, that whole timeline of uh, where you started from, why you came to the Islamic faith, when you came to it, and uh, what, what you liked about it? Oh, well, I'll try to be as concise as possible because I really like to get into the topic. Um, that said, it is mostly true that I did convert to the faith. However, my ancestry is, is, Muslim, is Islamic. I mean, um, my, uh, my grandparents originally come from the province of Andalusia, from Spain. Uh, they then, uh, in order to uh, migrate to the United States, they stopped off in Puerto Rico first. And that's where my parents were born. And uh, then my mother migrated to the United States, you know, and we were Catholic at the time uh, because my ancestors descended from Moriscos. Um, I didn't find this out until I was studying Islam later, at a later point in time you know, in the history of Islam, that I found out that my ancestors were actually Muslim, especially when I looked up my last name. Um, so that was interesting. 
And, uh, but the way, the reason I came to Islam was actually during sort of an existential crisis while doing my undergraduate in philosophy. That was during my senior year. And, uh, and I was sort of drifting away from, from traditional Christianity because I had moved away from Catholicism and moved into the Orthodox Church. And uh, there were a lot of discrepancies that I had with, you know, the, the doctrines. And I started looking for another faith that made, that made the concept of God more coherent to me. I never really um, had an issue with God itself, the concept of God itself. That was sort of something that I've always been sort of naturally attuned to. So it was more about the doctrine surrounding God, the religion that I thought was most appropriate, you know, message from God. And I found Islam to be the most coherent in that respect. Um, and I didn't find any sort of contradiction in his doctrines. And I found many of its moral precepts to be quite, um, uh, well, quite moral. Um, and I think it was also very easy for me to read the Quran in the sense that I was already very well educated in history and, and uh, other things. So I didn't find much conflict therein, um, at least, you know, initially. And, and even after that, I, I felt that there was always some sort of coherence. I never felt that uh, I had to ignore certain things. And so I've been quite comfortable in my faith since then. And that's, that's basically what I would say. So when you, um, one question, I guess, is that, uh, did you convert uh, to Islam? Did you accept the Islamic faith uh, before you started reading the Quran? Or did you become Muslim and then, uh, or did you read the Quran and that brought you to uh, the faith? Or was it a mix? I read the Quran and Islamic history and things like this. And I think there was a culmination of, of different factors that really brought me to the faith. Um, of course, you know, as a, the human experience is not simply intellectual. It's also in, in many ways spiritual. Even as an atheist, you know, you may not agree with that term spiritual, but I, I think you would agree with the term existential, as in, in a sort of emo emotive, you know, um, sense of being, you know, as a human being, you know, there, there are certain things that you, uh, that you are naturally attracted to, like the aesthetics of life and things like this, right? So, you know, those things can't be explained rationally. So there's a, there's a culmination between these two things uh, that really brought me to the faith. And you know, there are a number of details as well, but, you know, that's the general. <clears throat> okay, so are we going to get into this? And then uh, I'll, uh, Armin... Uh, there's I'll... echo. Oh, is there echo? Yeah. I don't know where that's coming well, from. Well, I think... Um... I think you, it's gone. Okay, right, it's gone. You're good. Okay, so um, uh, so also the, we're gonna, let's get into the uh, topic. The topic. And I Me wanted too. to kind of start with one a question from one of our patrons. His name is uh, Mikhail Mikulik. Mike. Mike. Okay, so we're just gonna call him Mike from now because he was also on the previous podcast, and I probably skewered his name uh, then too. Yeah. So one thing that you and I will definitely agree on is that there is anti-Muslim bigotry is real. Okay, so. I've gotten at people, I'm not even, I don't identify as Muslim at all, but I do get a lot of, anytime there's a terrorist attack and I say something about it, they say, get out of here, go back to your country, you dirty terrorist. I, I've gotten that kind of thing all the time. Uh, my, you know, my wife has gotten it too. So I do agree, and I think we both agree that anti-Muslim bigotry exists. But the question is about this word Islamophobia. So Mike wants to ask, Please define Islamophobia and why there is no Christianophobia or Mormonophobia. Before, before you answer, after after this one, if uh, the questions, let's um, let's go a little bit into the the actual topic. Like, is Islamic extremism Islamic, and then see go to the questions and also uh, more questions regarding the topic as well. But this is a good question, so uh, let's answer it. But then let's go to the meat of the. Yeah, topic. I, I wanted yeah. to actually go from here and then move on to the extremism. Yeah, yeah, okay. So. Okay. Well, that's a two-part question. The first part is how you define Islamophobia. Well, first off, I'd just like to say I have a contention with the term itself, because I feel that it's often, uh, the term Islam is often conflated with Muslims. But I think this is also partially due to bigotry itself. I think a lot of people have a difficulty separating the two, uh, both on the side, both on the, the positive side where people are supporting Islam and Muslims and the other side against. You know, um, you have a lot of bigots, for instance, that assume that every Muslim who disagrees with a particularly extremist interpretation is doing taqiyya or something is actually, you know, following. Mm -hmm. those. So they never really separate it. So that's partially a problem on both ends. I think the more appropriate term would be Muslim phobia. Uh, but like I said, until you have individuals on the bigoted end as well, uh, um, if, until you have them stop conflating the two Islam and Muslims, then I think this term will continue to be used. 
Uh, what, what is the difference between Islam and Muslim story? I, I'm surprised that we actually yeah. do largely agree on this, but uh, I have the same problem with the term Islamophobia, and I prefer the term anti-Muslim bigotry or you know anti-Muslimism, whatever. But <laughs> what, what is your view of the difference between Islam and Muslims? Well, Islam is a set of doctrines, a set of principles and practices that not all Muslims are naturally attuned to. Uh, or, or follow perfectly. I mean, even within academia, we, we make a distinction between Islam or Islamic and Islamicate. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, we will look at certain civilizations that were claimed to be Islamic to some degree, and uh, we'll show, you know, that, you know, at some point, like, for instance, the Ottoman Empire eventually did adopt, you know, allowed for their, their, their uh, constituents to um, drink alcohol. Now, we would never consider this to be an Islamic society at that point that point, you know, or that an Islamic identity or an Islamic um, behavior, right? It would be more of a part of the Islamic Kate civilization. So, I mean, this demarcation has existed for quite some time. I think it's just made popular in the media, like most terms, like moderate and, and extremist and things like this. Okay. Um, um, I, I think we're pretty much in agreement on this one. Um, Islam is like, so. You, so basically, you're saying you don't like the word uh, Islamophobia yourself. Islam is ideology. Everything that is Islamic doesn't mean that is uh, according to Islam mm -hmm. directly. It could be relevant to Islam, but not following Islamic teachings. Yeah. Uh, Muslims are Muslims even if they're not following Islam. Um, I think I think we're all in agreement on this one, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, but I do think I want to say once again that I do believe that there is partial blame or at least half the blame on the bigoted segments of society towards Muslims because they tend to have it. They don't, they don't differentiate. That's the problem. Well, the, the, yeah, I, think yeah, the, I think there's the, the motivation is on both sides to make Islam and Muslim the same thing because uh, a lot of people that want to defend Islam try to make Islam and Muslim the same thing because they want yeah. uh, the criticism of the ideology to be hatred and bigotry. And also a lot of people on the bigoted side want Islam and Muslim to be the same thing because they want to use people like us that are uh, the arguments that we have against Islam. They are, they have a problem with Muslims themselves rather than Islam, but they want to use uh, arguments against Islam as a way, as an excuse to hate and attack Muslims, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I, that's I'll just from my my own personal experience, I'll explain this here. I mean, there's, I, I do agree with Armin. I think it's on both sides. So on the, on the left, you have people saying that if you criticize Islam at all or do what me and Armin do, then you're a bigot against all Muslims, which is bizarre because I, most of my family is Muslim, and we have these debates all the time, and uh, they understand the difference between the two and they understand where I'm coming from. On the other hand, on the right, like you said, like on the far right, often uh, they say that oh, there are some problems with Islam, so that means that all Muslims must be, you know... Uh, nuke them, nuke them, nuke them. Well, nuke them. I, think, I think the best way to, to sort of define, I mean, to sort of encapsulate uh, this phenomenon is that it's two reactionary movements reacting to each other. Right, yeah. yeah. That's, I think yeah. that's a good and way to do it. they love each other. They feed on each other. Exactly. And I think that's a, that's, that's a huge problem. And I think it's, you know, right now you have sort of the very l overly liberalized left who's gone into postmodern territory beyond contemplate, you know, beyond reason. And they right. think everything is like horrible. Yeah. Um, and then you have the other side, which has gone extremely to the right. Right. All right. We're agreeing too much. Let's get into the disagreements. Right. <laughs> Let's get into disagreements. I, 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 I try to I try to stick to my principles. Sorry. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> no, 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 we're good. But I think we're That's gonna start idea. disagreeing a lot soon. Um, so, which is I, I'm very I'm I'm a fan of agreement. Armin is a fan of this. Actually, we're I'm we're both fans of both. But I, I do like a little bit of agreement from time to time as as a foundation. But right. Let's right. Go on. Armin, go for it. Start a well, fight. Okay, so basically, uh, the what we are, I think, the main disagreement that you know we have is um, that we think when we look when we read the Quran and so and ha the Hadiths, um, but I don't know if you want to go to the Hadiths. Maybe we want to focus on the Quran because most Muslims share that. Um, is we find a lot of the uh, teachings in the Quran problematic, uh, violent, barbaric, backwards, uh, insane, inhuman, anti-woman, anti-many things that are we value, right? And and we think all these positions that the Quran is taking is extreme, and if, and if it wasn't intended to be extreme, then it was very poorly communicated. Um, and there's two categories of these kinds of ideas that the Quran or Hadith um, well, mostly the Quran uh, when, if it, when it comes to these categories is um, 
as so just as values that we find a uh, very prob- um you know unhelpful and um in human is some uh, the two categories are the ones that are teaching muslims um what to do in this life and i think the a lot of people focus on this a lot of non muslims focus on this because um the second category which is what the quran teaches about the afterlife um, a lot of non muslims will think that we why we don't have to worry about that because we don't believe in that so it's not so we only care about the consequences of islam on us which is a part of the islamic teaching that teaches uh, what muslims should do to other non muslims or how they should behave in this world um well i i don't agree with that by the way but because um but also i'll get to that but a lot of muslims also when it comes to defending islam i see most of the defenses are also with regards to the teachings of the quran in this life uh, what happens in this life because they have been i think they have been trained to be more defensive against those verses because those are the verses usually people bring up when attacking islam um but I I think that um the second category is um as important if actually more important I think is the verses that are maybe even more important is are the verses that uh, are talking about non-muslims or infidels or kafirs and non disbelievers um, and what was going to happen to them to in the afterlife and um a lot of people tell me why would you care about that you're an atheist you don't even believe in hell i like yeah but but you do right you think this uh, why would you believe in a god that thinks that torturing um uh, disbelievers pouring hot water and then burning their skin and then putting their skin back on and then burning it again just because they didn't believe why would any why would you think that's okay and what does that say about you if you think that's that this is a fair thing to do to us even if you even if i think it's never going to happen the fact that is uh, is cons- this is considered we are considered deserving of such punishment is um, and people accept that as us deserving of such punishment is very problematic right um anyways i, I think i talked too much so maybe i will let you, any, uh, you guys talk about respond maybe a little bit okay uh well first off i'd like to kind of direct where the conversation is going here a little bit uh you mentioned hellfire there we can probably i think we should talk about that That said, uh, prior to this uh, podcast, I think we agreed upon mostly focusing sort of the violence aspect, if that's okay with you. Mm, Okay, but uh, did we? Because um, what do when we? Okay, I don't remember. (laughs) Uh, okay, okay, but all right. Sounds. Um, if if you want to t- t- head it to that direction, run, then you're. No, no, guess. no. I think I think no. I I do want to address the the hell aspect as well. The thing is that uh, because we have such little time, um, right? I want to focus on one issue particularly. Uh, okay. It's because when we talk about Islamic extremism, what we tend the imagery that tends to come up is not necessarily theological. What tends to come up is is the violent aspects of it. Um, and, um, I think that is what is, what most people are really concerned about and not so much the opinions that people have about the afterlife, as you actually already mentioned. Now that said, I'm not going to stray away from it. I mean, we can still talk about it, but I would like to focus on that primarily. Okay. So that's okay. Yeah. Sure. I, I just want to say in terms of the afterlife. I'll, echo again. There's echo again. Oh, really? Can you, is it gone now? No. Oh crap. I can't hear it. No, no, it's not. It's fine now. It's fine now. I think I can't hear either. Yeah, I think when I go from unmute to mute, I think that's what happens. So, uh, just to let the audience know, full disclosure, I'm eating fries, so I, I mute myself you when said I'm. You're not going to mention it. I, I, I just did. I had to <laughs> be open. It was killing me. All right. so it probably is killing me. Literally. All right, go on. <laughs> okay. So, you know, well, one thing, also that I want to talk about the Hellfire thing. The reason I think it is important and it is probably relevant to mm-hmm. the violence and the terrorism. You know, that we see in the headlines all the time nowadays is that I'll give you an example, you know, Surah 5 verses 72 to 73. They say that anybody who, uh, those who say that Allah is the son of Mary or, you know, is these are uh, disbelievers or according to some translations, blasphemers. It also says those who believe that Allah is one of three, as in believe in the Trinity, are disbelievers um, and or blasphemers. Mm-hmm. So, and for them, uh, there is a, a, a great punishment in the hereafter. 
Okay, so th- that's that's essentially the thrust of the verse. Now, when people see this, it doesn't say go kill Christians. It doesn't say Christians are, you know, they're, they're, that we should commit any violence against Christians. I mean, it does say you should fight Christians in other places, but not in this particular verse. But when people read it, they think that, okay, these people are so bad that God wants to punish them for eternity in hellfire. So that automatically creates a dynamic, a, 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 like in Pakistan, for instance, where just last week, another Christian uh, uh, boy was beaten to death by a mob, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and this happens all the time. Asia Bibi, who is a, a, you know, was accused of blasphemy. She's been in jail for ages. The governor of the largest province in that country who tried to uh, stand up for her. Uh, he was murdered by his own bodyguard and the bodyguard, the murderer's funeral had a million people at it. So uh, there, there is a sentiment there. And these, uh, when you have these words, they don't have to necessarily say fight the Christians, but they create an in-group, out-group dynamic that mm-hmm. we are good. These other people are going to go to hell forever. All right. So uh, that, in that way, it is connected to it. So the whole idea of hellfire, who's going to hell, who's not going to hell, how can you stay away from hell? And all these other people deserve hell because they're immoral and they've gone astray. That. It's sort of that rhetoric uh, that's in the Quran itself. I mean, the Hadith, it's all over the place, but let's stick to the Quran. This in the Quran itself. That really uh, puts a certain uh, kind of thought into the minds of people uh, and the, the way that they view other, other, their own fellow human beings just because they have uh, a different set of beliefs. So in that way, it is, it, it is. Connected. I mean, and to make Ali's point, I mean, imagine if I wrote a document that I said Muslims deserve to be tortured or the Jews deserve to be tortured or black people deserve to be tortured. Right. And if I, even though I didn't say go and torture the Jews or go and torture black people, if I just say these people are deserving of torture and punishment is still in not a very good tone to have against a whole group of people. Okay. Yeah. Right. Anyways, we should let you respond. Probably we talked too much. That's okay. I just have to respond to two points. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't see a core. I don't see a direct causation between uh, this particular ayahs and, and violence that's being committed in the world today. Um, like I said, many of the monotheistic traditions have similar verses in their text, and we don't see that occurring. Um, and I think that's a good comparative analysis there, especially with fundamentalist Christians in the United States. You don't see them doing those sort of things as a result. Uh, likewise, most of the persecution that's occurring right now against ethnic groups are being performed by atheists or individuals who don't even believe in an afterlife. For example, a Buddhist in Myanmar. Um, so, uh, and Bashar al-Assad, a uh, secular Baathist in Syria, who's currently slaughtering his own people. Um, so I, I find it hard to believe. Oh, and by the way, we can even go back further just a little bit during the uh, reforms of the Ottoman Empire when the Turkish uh, secular nationalists, the Young Turks, took over and committed the Armenian Genocide. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things there. I don't think there's a direct causation between suggesting that people are no longer, are not going to be in paradise, or going to be committing, you know, to hellfire and uh, issues of terrorism. Now, if that were the case, we would find uh, terrorism committed throughout Islamic history, but uh, of course you may, you know, contend against me regarding, you know, go against me regarding that, but I don't think that's the case. Um, as for the second point, I mean, I think it's uh, interesting that you mentioned if you wrote a document that said, well, these people are going to be tortured. Uh, I don't think there's a similarity there because, I mean, you're kind of implying that uh, the statements being made in the contemporary, like within this world, like they should be tortured right now. Whereas we're talking about matters outside, you know, which has no correlation with as far as or no causation in regards to how people act, you know, um, right here and now. I mean, for example, I believe the verses that you just noted, but I have no desire to harm you. I wasn't suggesting, I wasn't suggesting, I, I was just saying it was, it's wrong, whether I, oh, did, I wasn't well, suggesting as, uh, well, if you want to say wrong, that's fine. But I want to try to say is I don't see how that's connected to the topic at hand. Yeah, because you're, okay, so, so because we're, if you want to focus on violence regarding the first point that you're bringing up, um, when you bring up other examples that people without Islam committing violence, you know, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't it sound like I, me saying Nazi ideology is not harmful because I could find examples of non-Nazi uh, people uh, committing violence? No, I'm just saying that uh, there's no direct causation between belief in the afterlife and 
No, no, no. To, to you, in your response to Ali's point, right? You mentioned a whole bunch of secular people or Buddhist people or other groups of people that did harmful things, committed genocide and did a lot of things that had nothing to do with Islam, right? They committed these crimes without having anything to do with Islam. But I'm saying that wouldn't, can't I use these examples, the same examples that you brought up to suggest that Nazi ideology is not harmful because they were also not Nazis? Well, I'm just saying that there's no there's no evidence to suggest that belief in the aftermath leads to these events. Right. So th those are two separate claims. One to say that's what I'm responding to. Okay. Yes. No, but but I'm saying you there's one claim to say that there's no evidence, right? But then these counter examples doesn't really back. You know, you, you could. I could I could even give you more counter examples. Yeah. Right? So I'll I'll give you a, I'll I'll give I'll add to this and I'll just give one example. Uh -huh. uh, so um, for instance, you know when we see a lot of Islamic jihadists, right, um, who uh, like in, in ISIS or in Al Qaeda and so on, and what they do is they go out and and they actually take like Surah eight verse twelve. They think that they're in a time of war. They think Muslims are under attack. So and they think that this is completely in context where Surah eight twelve the Battle of Badr is used as an example, and it says, you know, and God said to the angels, um, cast terror, I will cast terror into the hearts of the disbelievers, so smite them upon the neck and smite uh, and, and strike off their fingertips. So it basically mm -hmm. tells them to behead them and cut off their fingertips. So what they do is they actually take these words and they carry out these actions, and they say, Allahu Akbar, as they do it. They quote these, these things in their literature, and many of them are very, very well versed with the Qurans, M many of them have it memorized with meaning. So they do that, and people say, well, you know, this has nothing to do with Islam. But on the other hand, you know, you're giving the example of, for instance, the uh, Myanmar Buddhists and who are doing this. There's nothing in their religious doctrine that's making them do this. And this is obviously, it, it's an aberration. So what we've done is we've found one example of, uh, you know, the, the Buddhists in Myanmar doing the same horrible things that uh, Islamic jihadists do all over the world on, on a daily basis. And we're saying, okay, see, so they both do it. But when you actually look at the doctrine, um, there's nothing in Buddhist doctrine that actually tells them to do that. There's nothing in atheist. There is no atheist doctrine that tells anybody to do anything. But with the Islamic jihadists, their actions, right, are translations. They're, they're visual and visceral translations that we can see in three dimensions of the verses that they're carrying out exactly. Okay. You know, um, so this is this is a point of confusion for many non-Muslims. So I understand there are a lot of Muslim people who say, well, it's misinterpreted and doesn't mean this out of context. But to non-Muslims who are actually reading the word, they're like, you know, am I going to look at the word of God, what they say is the word of God? Or am I going to look at all these human beings and their extensive books on tafsir and yeah. uh, exegesis and so on? So uh, how, how would you would, how, how would you go about countering that? Well, first off, I think the conversation get a little bit muddied here because the claim that I heard in the beginning was that there is a direct causal link between belief in the afterlife, hellfire, and terrorism. That's no, no, we're responding. moving on. Now I'm moving on okay. to that's well, that's what I've been responding to the entire time. So okay. that's what I don't understand where we're going into this other territory. That said, um, I did hear a couple of claims in your in your response, which I think are inaccurate. Uh, for example, you mentioned that jihadis if we want to refer to them as a, uh, have uh, a lot of knowledge about Islam. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that the case? Uh, in, uh, well, I mean, there are obviously many jihadis who just kind of go in and they just do it because they're paid money. I mean, that's absolutely true. But, um, for example, we had Tanya Joy on the podcast. She's the ex-wife of, uh, Yahya al the commander in ISIS. And, um, he is actually a chronic linguist. He's, he, he aligns with the Zahiri, uh, um, school of thought, the Zahiri, uh, uh, I guess, the philosophy where uh, they're linguists and he has the first Arabic uh, uh, grammar book memorized that was ever written, first Arabic dictionaries memorized. He has a Quran memorized. He has, he knows what each and every word means. Uh, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi himself, he's got a PhD in the Quranic text, in the actual language of the Quran. So, so these are knowledgeable people, the people who are actually writing this. I mean, so. Baharumi is, is the guy who wrote the Dabak magazine and he uh, um, there was the editor of it too and he put it out and published it. Mm. So these are people who are very actually very well versed uh, with the Quran. Of course there's like pawns and there's like soldiers and the people that go to the front line who are just 
you know, and that they're just kids and they're just doing it because they've been told, you know, they can get versions of the afterlife and this puberty and the segregation. So that's, you know, there's other, things, many different motivations, but um, at the leadership levels, a lot of these jihadist leaders um, are definitely very well-versed in, in the Quran and the Quranic language and Islamic history as well. All right. Uh, well, first off, what was the, the sister's name that you interviewed? I forgot her name again. Uh, oh, her name, her name is Tanya Joya. I mean, no, Tanya. let's forget about her. Let's talk, okay. let's talk, uh, yeah, I'm talking no, about no, her I, husband. Her yeah, John a number George of claims. So, um, mm-hmm. All right. Well, I, I disagree with you in terms of their education level. My PhD is on ISIS. I've studied their documents in depth, including in every single dis- issue of Dabiq and mm-hmm. Ruman. Um, I have gone over them extensively. I've also looked into the backgrounds of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and many of his leading um, uh, associates. And I found that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi only has a uh, PhD in uh, Tajweed, which is not something that I would consider to be sufficient for uh, giving thick and uh, opinions on a soul. Okay, can you define Tajweed for the... Uh, for tajweed the is just recitation of the Quran. It doesn't necessitate that he actually understands the meaning of Tafsir. Uh, so it just means that he knows how to recite every different Qur'an, um, which is essential for any hafid of the Qur'an, but uh, it's not essential to understand the meaning of it as a result of that. Uh, he's also been uh, bashed by al-Nusra front as a result, uh, constantly told how ingr- ignorant he is as a result of that. Um, <clears throat> and many uh, leading authorities in al-Qaeda have also spoken about his ignorance. His Sorry, can you, can you uh, clarify what's essential? It's essential for, what is essential? I just... I wouldn't, you said something is essential for understanding the Quran. What was that? No, not understand the Quran. You need to understand like tafsir and fiqh and usul, like things like I'm just saying things to give like legal opinions mm. in all respects to these things. But he's only uh, his only education is in tajweed. Uh, as for this other individual, I'm not very familiar with him. It's the first time I've actually heard of him when his wife mentioned him. Um, and uh, I'm not too familiar with his background of my studies. I haven't actually. That said, uh, there are a number of studies uh, from many prominent academics that showcase that the majority of ISIS fighters, the vast majority, are very, very uneducated when it comes to Islam. Uh, from interviews from, from Anne Speckhard, 400 interviews that she did with talking to terrorists, including her recent book in, uh, uh, about ISIS. Uh, we have numerous studies from Olivier Roy, a French sociologist and political philosopher. And I have many of their uh, quotes here, if you'd like. Uh, showcasing what they've learned on the subject regarding their education and their motivations as well. Uh, we can get into that in depth if you wish. Um, um, do, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's... Okay, can I, can I, but can I, I actually, I agree with that. I, I'm pretty sure most, um, not only most ISIS fighters, I think most Muslims are, are not very educated on Islam. Would that be a fair uh, thing yeah. to say? Yeah, that, I think that's why fair. I specified and I said the leadership. I uh, well, I think the leadership is quite ignorant. No, so uh, was that fair? Is that a fair assessment? Yes. I mean, for example, let's let's just give a hypothetical here. <laughs> or not hypothetical. Let me just ask you a question. Uh, I have a number of questions to ask you as well. Uh, I've read your book, Ali. So it was actually well written. Yeah. Okay, wait, you haven't read my book? Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, Armin. I apologize. Oh, no. Okay. I will do it next. Okay, you're not invited back here. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. I, prom- I promise you I will read you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that said, Ali, I, I wanted to read yours first. Um, uh, I just I, I like the title. I apologize, Armin. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I went through your book, and uh, I found it very interesting. Um, there are a lot of things I disagree with, obviously, but I thought it was well written. Uh, and I want to ask you about that. But first off, I'd like to discuss what is your definition of fundamentalism? And I think you refer to it as, as, as being a literalist. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Was that be an accurate depiction? Um, accurate depiction of, fund- of what a fundamentalist is in terms of any, would you consider, for instance, like Osama bin Laden to be a fundamentalist? Well, well, based on the definition of literalist, I consider most Muslims to be fundamentalists. Okay. But would you consider, like, say, anyone who takes the hadith and the Quran to the letter and does everything without, you know, making excuses of things like this, you know, mental gymnastics to be somebody like Osama bin Laden? No. No. No, no, no. no. Uh, just because you think that the, the Quran should not, is not a metaphor and it's taken to be literalist, that doesn't make that doesn't mean that you're going to go and want to kill people. Okay, but I'm just wondering, like, in terms of like terrorism, you think he's following everything? Directly or? Well, um, no, I, well, I hit, well, my my issue is that the the book is 
not very clear. And the, the, the most clear parts of it seem very barbaric uh, and violent. But you could, the problem with books like the Quran and the Bible um, are, are that you could make it, you could argue for almost any conclusion that you want if you play around with it enough, right? The, when I say somebody is a fundamentalist, that, does, that doesn't mean they're, they're following it correctly. That just, when somebody is a fundamentalist, that means that they think that there is no, God is not playing games with you. There's no puzzle here to solve. This is not metaphor. This is not poetry. And you have to just, just meditate to, for it, to, for you to understand. This is just black and white. Read it and you understand it. Uh, that's what, uh, that's what a fundamentalist is to me. But that doesn't mean that just because they think they have read it and came to the clear, clear conclusion, that doesn't mean that they're all going to come to the same conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. Some people, everybody's going to read it and there's a lot of fundamentalists are going to be like, well, this obviously means this. But even though they think it's obvious, another fundamentalist could be saying, no, this obviously means that. And it could be completely in contradiction to what the first fundamentalist said, right. he or she. So I think uh, we can discuss the uh, issues of interpretation at a later point. Okay. That said, my, my, my main question is just, do you think Osama bin Laden is, is following the doctrines in respect to terrorism? So um, I, I'll answer that. I, I think uh, to no. a large extent when it comes to, well, I, I think to the, yes as, no. far as, the, yeah, as far as the doctrines of terrorism, I think that... Um, uh, ISIS is following them. I think Osama bin Laden, to a large extent, uh, followed them. Um, Osama bin Laden, I don't think was uh, to, to my in my view, he wasn't as educated about it as I think that the ISIS leadership is. And I know we disagree on that. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, you could say that you know when you talk about the fundamentalists. From what I see, the Quran, like the other monotheistic texts, is full of contradictions. Okay, there are contradictions. Some of them can be explained by, you know, chronology. So, you know, some stuff came earlier, some stuff came later. But from, in my reading, and also having gone through a lot of the tafsir and, and reading about it for many years, um, I do think there are a lot of contradictions. So you can take somebody uh, who who takes the good things out of it about the treatment of orphans, for instance, right? And then and, and you can say, okay, they're following, they're a fundamentalist in the sense that they're selectively following this good thing in it. And, and yes, the following of the violent stuff is also selective. Um, this is why you can't really judge a person. Uh, you have to judge specific actions, right? right. I mean, I and, could, and I could, you could come up with examples with everybody, anybody that were like, okay, they, they did this and I can't find anything in the mm -hmm. Quran that suggests that. Um, or you could be like, well, this action that they specifically did. I mean, for example, when, when ISIS people were killing um, Christians, right? Um, that was, I'm, I'm pretty sure Ahlul Kitab is protected under Islam, right? So I was like, okay, that doesn't seem, even, uh, even as somebody that is fighting Islam, that does seem that you can't just kill Christians right, like that. Maybe if they were Hindu, uh, or atheists, but Christians and Jews, um, unless they, uh, unless they didn't pay the jizya or outright denied converting, or moving, you can't just you line them up like that and behead them. So you, uh, there are examples that you come up with that you can like, okay, this is definitely not Islamic, even if even if I'm against it. Uh, but it, you can't judge an, a whole group or an individual. You have to you have to look at specific actions. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I, and I wanted I wanted to just one last thing before you go ahead, Asad, and before you respond is that. Um, I think that if you, one thing you can't do, when I was talking about the selective, you know, when you say fundamentalist or literalist, I mean, I don't think anybody can be a literalist of, literalist of the entire Quran in terms of practice and following it, because I feel like many things that are at loggerheads with each other, there are many contradictions. However, <clears throat> if you, you can't follow the peaceful stuff in the Quran if you, and, and discard the violent stuff, I don't think you can do that, because if you do that, then you're ignoring a lot of what is the infallible word of God, okay? On the other hand, if you follow all the violent stuff, right, you can still follow the peaceful stuff because you can say, okay, treat orphans well. We're going to treat the orphans of the Muslim Ummah well. But the infidels, the Yazidis, the polytheists, we're not talking about their orphans. We're talking about our orphans. When we're talking about women, we're talking about our women. We're talking when we're talking about treating people justly. We're talking about our group. You know, we're not talking about the uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the people who don't believe, or you know, the the Christians who came before who refused to convert or pay the, the pay the jizya. We're not talking about them. So, 
people who are who follow the violent aspects of it and take the book as a whole, for them there is a way to incorporate the peaceful elements of the scripture. But I, I don't think um and, and I I've thought about this a lot. I really don't think there's a way to follow it peacefully and uh, just uh, sort of disregard uh, the the violent stuff. I think that makes it right. uh, that makes it cherry picking. But go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, I believe that I am reading it holistically, and I believe that there is a way to read it holistically. I think we disagree on that respect. Uh, that said, I do believe also that ISIS and Al Qaeda and others are actually the cherry pickers. I believe that they're the reformist in our tradition, and I believe that uh, anyone who thinks that they are close or that they are reading the certain passages in an accurate way are ignorant of the scripture as well. Um, I think there are a number of places where the Quran is violent, and I'm very okay with that because I think the violence is justified in many respects. And I believe that there are other places where it clarifies that violence to, to the extent where it's, it, it's, it clearly states that it's not against innocent people. And I think I can point that out very easily without <laughs> resulting in mental gymnastics or anything. So, so, so your main argument uh, on the violent parts is that, um, that the Quran is specifically talking about combatants and people that attacked Muslims. It's not talking about all kafiruns or mushrikuns or it's basically talking about the specific battle at that time. It's talking about people that, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and you can't just take these verses and say, look, God is saying, kill the kafirun, kill the disbelievers. Um, no, it's basically we're talking about a specific situation and armed combatants, and you have to take it into context. Is that that's your main argument for the violent uh, orders in the Quran? Is that correct? Yeah, I would say that's a pretty concise variation. But I mean, even if you just look at the Quran itself, it's not it's not like it's implicit; it's explicit as well in non-abrogated Medani verses that state very explicitly who it's referring to. Right, but so, so here's the thing: imagine if I was being attacked by um, somebody. And and then I all, all of a sudden want to go retaliate or defend myself and get my buddies to go retaliate. And this person that happened to attack me happened to be a Jew. Okay. okay. But then I get all my friends are like, come, let's go attack the Jew. Let's kill the Jew. He's this Jew has threatened my family and has promised to um do this to us and do that to us. We need to defend ourselves against this Jew. This, you know, wouldn't, don't you think that I have, like, what, can I, why wouldn't I just say this guy that attacked me? Why wouldn't I just say this, uh, this person that is targeting my family? The fact that I keep mentioning that this guy is a Jew and we should kill the Jew and defend ourselves against the Jew, doesn't that kind of suggest that I, the, why would I even bring the fact that he's Jew into the conversation? What does that got to do with anything? I mean, the fact that, um, so let's say these were, God is saying that you have to attack these people because they are, are com- they're attacking Muslims. And it's just because they're armed combatants and that's why uh, God is saying defend yourself. Um, I, 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 don't, I didn't know, by the way, that this was a problem that people at that time, when, when before God commanded this, people when, when used to get attacked, people, did they just take it before God made this commandment? But anyways, um, now that God is saying go defend yourself, why couldn't he just say, at defend yourself against people that attack you. Why does the fact that they're kafirun has anything to do with the fact that you need to defend yourself against the people that are attacking you? Why constantly mention the fact that they don't believe, that, that they didn't accept the message of Allah, that they disbelieved in the uh, prophet and his message? What does that, if, 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 they, if the criteria for you attacking these people is simply with the fact that they're attacking you, why constantly, I mean, the word kafir is one of the most uh, constantly me- mentioned, the fact disbelievers and the, what the things that you need to do against them and the things that the God is going to do to them. I know you mentioned we don't want to mention afterlife, but this is one of the most uh, uh, obsessive words that is con- con- constantly mis- mentioned in the Quran, uh, the disbelievers. I think it's mentioned, mo- uh, anyways, I'll let you respond. But do you get my point? Yeah, I'm going to answer it in two ways. Okay. First off, because that was the primary means of identification for nationality back then, was through religious, ident- religious identity. So it was much easier. Let me ask you a question in response to that. If I said the Americans bombed Japan, is that uh, racist against all Americans or hate speech against all Americans? 
Uh, no, but if you said we should kill the Americans, we should find them wherever they, we should find Americans wherever they are and oh, the kill them. Refer to the Americans while they're being bombed. So the Americans have invaded us. We should kill the Americans when we find them. Yeah. Are they refer to every single American citizen. So I have two responses to that. First of all, I would suggest to them to change the language. Yes, I would. Second of all, I might, I might be forgiving to them because they're only human, not God. Uh, second of all, no, uh, third of all, sorry, no, um, no, it, I would be even more, I would even apply a higher standard to what they were saying against the Americans. If some people were about to take their words and follow them as uh, their guide to how to live forever. Right. So um, it, it, if, for example, let's say a general said, kill the Japanese. And we were like, dude, can you not say kill the Japanese? And he said, well, I'm obviously not talking about all the Japanese. I'm talking about these Japanese that are attacking us. First of all, I would tell him, OK, but seriously, you need to say you need to adjust your language. I know what you maybe. OK, this is not good. Right. Second of all, um, if if this general had a cult following and people were take, writing every language, everything he said, and said like, because people people constantly said that say to us that these are for specific battles at a specific time. It's obviously talking about a specific group of people, but at the same time, we can't make this argument that well, then every one of these messages are are uh, guidance for all Muslims for all time. Then what what are we supposed to take out of? Uh, l l such a language against Kafirun. I mean, if it's if 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 the, if if the intention was not to show all Kafirun as uh, evil and deserving of attack, they could, this could have been very easily avoided, right? I mean, the best you could, the worst you could say about this God is that he actually thinks that all Kafirun deserve deserve to, all not disbelievers deserve to be attacked and killed. But the best thing you could say about this guy is that he really sucks at communication. He should have seen, he should have known that in the future, uh, if he didn't really intend for people to think that disbelievers deserve to die, look at, like, look, we have the power of hindsight, right? We could see that a lot of Muslims think that. Um, a lot of government, forget, but God, God should have had the power of hindsight ahead of time. Um, he should have known that this is going to be something that he should have been uh, clar clarifying and maybe not talking about the Kafirun in that in 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 that. Car. If yeah. the best you could say about him is that he sucks at com uh, yeah. uh, communication. So, Go, so I, said, I said, feel free to jump in. Yeah, whenever sorry, you I, can I, I like to like you guys. I prefer to let you guys finish. No, 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 no. I, I interrupt no. Ali. Ali interrupts oh, me. You I, should. The thing is, I like to do that because I like to get the full gist of your argument. If I interrupt you, I feel like I'll miss something. Yeah. But, but you were you were talking about the example of the uh, Japan attacking Japan. Okay, but, yeah, uh, well, I just wanted to uh, mention two points against that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, the definite article D is usually not in reference to a universal subject, and it tends to be contextualized by other statements or behaviors occurring around us. It's very common sense in every major language and syntax. Um, so I don't think that that needs to be really clarified too much. Uh, that said, uh, there is a. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, like during World War II, nobody would have assumed that you meant every Japanese person or every United States citizen when you said the Americans or the Japanese. Unless, uh, you, unless you specify that everything I say is a guidance for, for people to follow at all ages, uh, for all men at all time. No, that's irrelevant. How so? That's irrelevant because the context still is within that prescription. So basically, if, if the cons, if the. But, if, but then what's the point? What's the point of uh, putting up. Uh, so here, uh, so there but, is that, but based on that argument, you could throw the whole Quran away because everything it says uh, uh, is supposed to be for that. But, uh, uh, yeah, but I, I want to just voice a disagreement here, Asad, with, with you. Like, I've, and I'll give you the same example of uh, Surah 8, verse 12, because I did mention it before about mm -hmm. you know the angels casting terror into the hearts of the disbelievers and you know slicing their, their, their necks and their fingertips. So that's uh, verse 8, 12. It's clearly about the battle of Badr. Mm -hmm. That was the first battle that, the, that Muhammad, or the prophet Muhammad fought with the Quraysh. Now, I, I was on The Agenda with Steve Bacon. This is a TV show here in Canada. And I was speaking with Shabir Ali. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yep. Um, and I mentioned this to him and immediately, obviously, he said that, you know, that's from the Battle of Badr. I'm like, yes, but the very next verse, Surah 8, verse 13, says, and whosoever opposes Allah and his messenger. And over here, it isn't even a belligerent thing. It's not about war. It's just about opposing Allah and his messenger. Like um, will suffer a grievous penalty. So what, what's actually happening is the Surah 812 right, is, is talking about the Battle of Badr. It's giving the example of what should be done. 
uh, when Muslims are being attacked, right? Granted, um, which a lot of you know ISIS and all these people—that's what they believe the, the the state that they're in is a state where Muslims are being attacked. And then the very next verse says, "And this example applies to whosoever opposes Allah and His Messenger." So often, when you're talking about uh, verses or commandments, uh, or you know that that are constrained within that context, when that claim comes up, they're almost always is a qualifier along with it uh, that demonstrates that that sort of uh, example in time is just an example. That's an example of, the, look, this is what we did back then, the Battle of Badr, and this is what should be done. This is the example that I want to give for all of you, right? So, and, and that makes more sense logically too, because it wouldn't make any sense logically to have, you know, a, a book from the creator of the universe that is a final word from the creator of the universe. And it's not, it, is, it isn't even that long. It's very short compared to the Bible. And, and you have this book that is only putting things that only applied for a small period of time, just a few months or a couple of years at the most. Um, so it logically makes sense that these examples would be used as an example for all time rather than just being constrained in the context of that time. And, well, and, you, can see, and you can see, and just to make at least point, um, you can see tafsir after tafsir. I, I know you could find tafsirs that make your point that these uh, these verses don't make suggest violent um, being violent against this believer but the fact that we also have a lot of tafsir that look read these verses arab speaking scholars and their tafsir their commentary on it was that these verses do suggest yeah. the further we, back you go the more sort of like conservative yeah and, yeah and they do suggest that we need to kill disbelievers and fight against them it does suggest that if god didn't mean that the fact that so many arab speaking scholars got it wrong shows that the communication was not at all efficient. Right, right. So, so I want to ask, could you, could you just kind of, um, so when you're talking about the constraint within a certain context, so that, that we have a disagreement on that, but do you, do you have any views on that, on, on what yep. I just said? I do. Mm -hmm. I believe that first off, the context cannot specifically be constrained to the particular statement therein, but also the entire text in which it's put it. I okay. mean, for example, you know, just to give you a, a, a brief, you know, Example, for example, you know, if I skimmed through Harry Potter and I came to the conclusion that Dumbledore was Harry Potter's father because he got, you know, frisky with one of the students, you know, you'll probably see that as a very bad interpretation because I'm missing out a few things, right? Because I'm not taking the whole book as a whole. Mm -hmm. As a result, you know, for example, you somewhat only kind of looked at the context within that particular verse, but not the entire text. So, for example, you've missed out on uh, sort of 60 verse 8 through 9, which is a metony sort of, has not been abrogated. No major scholar suggests that it is from Imam Tabari, Imam Kathir, to uh, Imam Qurtubi and others, uh, it still remains relevant throughout all time. And, and I think it's very relevant in this discussion because it was a response to a particular individual who thought that they should be mean to all disbelievers, including their own parents. And the Quran responded to that individual by saying the following, if I may quote, um, I think this is very relevant. Like I said, Allah does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of religion and do not expel you from your homes from being righteous towards them and acting justly towards them. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. Allah only forbids you from those who fight you because of religion and expel you from your homes and aid in your expulsion. And he forbids that you make allies of them. And whoever makes allies of them, then is those who are the wrongdoers. So yeah. basically me and Alito. Hmm? Like, yeah. yeah, you're cool, man. That's why I'm cool with you. No, 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 no. We are fighting against Allah. Are you? Yeah, we are. I mean, we, I mean, we could be based on, based on what is considered fighting. We are... Uh, me and uh, Ali and a lot of other people that you consider uh, okay people, we are actively trying to fight Islam. Okay. Right? So does that mean that we're fair game? Fair game in what sense? In attacking and killing. Um, but not in that sense. Mm -hmm. But, but how, who's there are, to decide? There are, who's there are other Quranic ayahs that also mention that the explicitly that we only retaliate in kind. For example, you're speaking to me. I'm speaking back. No, okay. So when when you say warfare, warfare. and so then sorry, hold on, Armin. Armin. On. So there are other ayahs that say that we respond in kind. So just for the audience, can you mention some of them? Okay, look, there are many instances of the kisas, for example. I want to give you one. Mm -hmm. Imam Kurtubi also mentions that these uh, his old tafsir also mentions this only regards to it does not mention attacking innocent people, for example. Uh, excuse me. Can I can I just? No, I, I want to just put a pen in that. I want to. I want to get back to the concept of innocent people. But Armin, go ahead. Yeah, just like for example, if if you consider a general in an army, 
that commands troops, tells them where to go, um, and um, makes plans. D D D even if he he or she himself never shot a single person, um, people consider that person fair game to take out because even if it's uh, right. So um, well, based on that. Anything. I know, but I'm just saying that the, the definitions is not very clear on who's considered an enemy, who's against Islam. The fact is that you could argue anybody uh, to be uh, uh, waging war against Allah or Islam, right? Who cares, especially, though? especially me and Ali or other people that are just speaking. Um, what does that matter? Well, but it, okay. He, let me let me make a, make a point like this. You you you're talking about the standard communication. I say when if I say uh, kill the Americans, then if you look at the context, you can see that I'm specifically talking about certain Americans, right? But uh, it, if this was somebody shouting or somebody making a command, that's different. If if somebody like if you go even to it, even slightly more serious written thought through documents like the the documents that my building management publishes. They even they that's not that serious, but you can see that they are defining terms. When I sign a contract, they the, even though the consequences is not as much of the Quran as big as the Quran, they define the terms to make sure there's no ambiguity, right? When now, if you go higher consequences, if you look at documents produced by the UN or uh, laws written by the government, they are even they know the consequences of getting these things wrong is even more. So they go even in more detail just to make sure that there's no loopholes, there's no misunderstanding. Even and even after that, they still sometimes people. Uh, criticize them for not being clear enough and being, uh, but now you're talking about the document that is more serious and more important than all of these. That's supposed to come from the creator of the universe. That is supposed to be a perfect, infallible guide for all humans. And you're saying that we just, the standard of communication that you're applying to that is with this Japanese referring to the Americans. Um, instead of like looking at like I would you know I would I would expect way more clarity from completely um, predict how different people are going to read this text and uh, you know interpret it you know the fact that so many people have read it and com concluded that this is obviously means something that you don't agree with sh um, shows to me that either this text is advocating violence or very badly written. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will respond to that in two ways as well, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Because first off, I believe that Ali disagrees with you on your first point regarding people interpreting these things. Remember, this topic is about whether Islamic extremism is Islamic. So in def definite, defining Islamic, in chapter two of your book, Ali, if I may quote you, I'm sorry, uh, mm -hmm. defining Islam or any religion, for that matter, by the actions of its adherents is problematic. The actions of the religious are not the definition of the religion. So right. I don't think that we should be using that as a benchmark. Uh, okay. Secondly, I think that, and I think that Ali would disagree with you in that respect. I'm just quoting you. So I, I think that. I, I don't can you can you repeat that part? That was a little bit. No, uh, what what I was uh, what what you, uh, it's uh, part of my, what I said was that we define Islam or I define Islam by the content of the scriptures, Islam's canonical texts. So I, yeah. I define it by the context of the scriptures, not by the practices of its adherents. But I, I think Armin and I do kind no, of. No, I agree with that. I don't. Okay. I don't think Muslims. I don't think all Muslims follow Islam. Yeah, go ahead. I really don't care whether or not this person interprets it that way or not. What I'm concerned about is what is is actually Islamic in a sense. So whether or not now we want to get to your clarity argument, we can do that. That's fine. Now I think that it's it's problematic to always assume that somehow a text is clear. Um, I think that at some point you have to you have to sit down and, and ask yourself a question: Is it the text or is it the person? Because there are many explicit verses in the Quran the Hadith and Sira literature that make it very, very clear as far as I'm concerned. And I find it very difficult to always have to blame the text when I myself have no issue. Um, I, I don't see why it always has to be the problem with the text just because an idiot over here thinks it's something else. You know, I don't really... Get but the, the idiots you're talking about are scholars, are many scholars. people, are... I mean, Who? I mean, the fact is that you're when you say idiots... This is this is supposed to be a book for the most simple-minded people. It's supposed. No, it's not. It never said that at all. Never, not once. Doesn't it say there's a verse that says that this is a clear message yes, for those who understand, for those who reflect and think, not idiots. Yeah, for those who understand. Okay, that's the yeah, there, there are several verses that say this is a clear book uh, that is uh, fully detailed, that is complete. Um, so that's actually uh, those verses. Is, are is it clear for those who understand? Isn't that a bit circular? 
Anyways, never mind. Yeah. I mean, because the thing is, it's asking people to reflect. There's also many verses, or one verse in particular, which mentions that there are those who are going to be focusing on the ambiguities of the text in order to, you know, find issues therein, and they're lost. Yeah, it's um, Surah 3, verse 7, uh, yeah, but, so right? There's a, so it doesn't ever say that it's for everyone. It never says that. Yeah, but but that kind of uh, that is also uh, that that can also be looked at in two ways. So that verse yeah. itself can be looked at allegorically, even though it goes against the allegory thing. But anyway, that, well, I mean, uh, uh, we we can go into it. This I wrote about that verse specifically in my book as well. Um, but it, it will go off to off topic. So I just wanted to get back to, uh, and we can, we can have a discussion about that later. I I don't want to avoid it. I I think it's a very interesting verse. But I I wanted to go back to something you said. Uh, just to try to stick to this topic about innocence, okay? Mm-hmm. And I want to give you the example of uh, Surah verse five thirty-two, uh, Surah five verse thirty-two, which um, is a very oft quoted verse by uh, some of the, um, uh, the 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 sort of, I guess, the apologists or what I know you don't like this term, but the moderate quote unquote Muslims, and uh, that's the one that says that whoever kills an innocent, um, it's as if he's killed all mankind. Whoever saves a person. It's as if he has saved all mankind. And that's actually, you know, like a lot of the Quranic scripture, it's actually part of the, it comes from the oral Torah as well, yeah. which says virtually the same thing in Sanhedrin. Uh, so now when it says that, the actual verse says this. Okay, so I'm going to quote again. Uh, we decreed upon the children of Israel that whoever kills a soul unless for a soul or for corruption done in the land... Mm-hmm. It's as if he had slain mankind entirely. That's where the innocent connotation comes in. And whoever saves one, it's as if he has saved mankind entirely. Obama, Obama now, quoted that. Obama quoted that too. Now, what happens is that uh, the, who are the people? What if the person is not innocent? What if the person did cause corruption in the land? Mm-hmm. Then you go on to the next verse, and the next verse says that those people who have caused corruption and who've waged war against Allah and His Messenger. Uh, is none but they be killed or crucified, their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides, and they be exiled from the land. Okay, so so here's a problem with this. So your argument, you said that it's very clear that this is uh, it does not apply to innocent people. I don't think so. Yeah. So here, here's the problem with it. The what is the the def, You know, we're talking about defining terms, and we must define this, define that. But one of the terms we really have to define that nobody really does is innocent, because back at that time, at the time of the Quran revelation in that society fornicators were not innocent apostates were not innocent mm-hmm. uh people who um criticized or questioned uh, the the quran blasphemers you know uh, heretics they weren't considered innocent gay people um were not innocent you know the women who who um went out and if they wanted to perform on stage in front of an audience and sing uh, or it's something like that, that they were they weren't innocent right so all of those people, and there's this remnants of this in, in the Quran, like those the definition of what's innocent now, and what's innocent then, a lot of the people we consider innocent now, like fornicators, like adulterers, like, like uh, uh, you know, female performers, like feminists, like homosexuals, like all of these people today are back at that time were not innocent and, and would have come under that. I mean, now we're at this point where if somebody draws cartoons of Muhammad, that's considered waging war against Allah. That means that that verse talking about them being crucified applies to them. It can reasonably, uh, th- there's a plausible, the verse can be plausibly interpreted to apply to people who are drawing cartoons of Muhammad because that can plausibly be interpreted as a uh, waging war against Allah and his messenger, right? So the, do, do you see what I'm saying in terms of the definition of innocent and how that has uh, evolved and changed? Saying, I think there are a number of nuances here that haven't been made explicit, and I think that would uh, need to be made explicit. Okay, so go, go ahead and explain. I, I'm, I'm going to mute myself so I can uh, hear. So for example, for instance, you mentioned that adulterers and such like this would be not considered innocent. Adulterers, homosexuals themselves, are innocent because the action of killing them within the Islamic State has nothing to do with them being adulterers or homosexuals. The action of doing so is when they publicly do these things in a public sphere, like in public, where people can see them doing it. Go ahead. Let me just stop you for just for a second. Uh, hom- uh, so homosexuals in terms of having sex in public, because that's not yeah. what they're doing. They're yeah, not having sex in public. They're just openly declaring themselves as homosexuals. Oh, that's their business. 
According to you. No, no, no. no, no sorry. Sorry. Go, go ahead and finish what you were saying. According to Islam, look, public acts of sodomy, public acts of fornication where four witnesses can notice it, not barging into their homes because actually Islam is also explicit in that you can't enter private property without permission. Uh, it requires that the death penalty be, be given as a result of that. Okay, so so if you have sex in public, you yeah, think it's okay dead. to it's okay to kill the gay. Well, you're people. pretty stupid to do that if you know the death penalty is going to be. For All them. right, so you're okay. So you're okay. It's okay to kill them because they're pretty stupid. I think it's okay because they're asking for it by actually agreeing. No, let's just say they're very stupid. No, well, no. If they're actually insane or something, then they, shoot, then they can't be punished. Maybe they're just doing it because they think you, you, they're fighting for their rights. Well, then they're idiots, and they should be killed. Then they're asking for it. They're agreeing with the punishment. So they should be killed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's let's move on to the uh, pasta issue because I, I want to bring all these things together. So some someone uh, has renounced Islam. They stay quiet about it. They don't do anything. They don't make a public big deal about it. Okay. They they don't start a website called Atheist Republic about it. Then yeah. then it's fine. But what what if they publicly hey, uh, criticize? No, no, they, they criticize the ideology in the same way that Muhammad actually criticized the Quraysh's religion and their idolatry. Mm -hmm. Supposing they do the same thing uh, to Muhammad's religion uh, in an Islamic state where the laws are according to your interpretation, what you think uh, Islam is, what should the punishment for apostates be in that regard? Is apostates in the context of an imperial state? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, it, apostates in the context of an imperial state. What do you What do you mean by imperial state? Islamic imperial state. Yeah, basically. So if if we had the ideal situation where we had an Islamic imperial state, then me and Ali should be put to the sword. Yeah, if we live in a time of empire, because it makes perfect sense. Why? In, in the time of empire. Okay, go ahead. Or a time of empire back then, or if we, like we could still get into a time like that, right? And if we get back in that condition, we have in quite some time. Now. And why would that be okay to put me and Ali to the sword if, if so that the came? state for every empire was war. And denouncing one's religion, which was your citizenship, meant that you were at war with the state. Uh, so if you denounce your citizenship, if you renounce your citizenship, you were at war with the state? Basically. Wait, so if Canada goes into war with the United States and I decide that I don't want to be a Canadian citizen anymore, it's okay for Canada to execute me? No, you're in a nation state system where the default is no longer war. Mm hmm. No, but if if they were in war with the United States, if the default was that you was the case that you were going to the United States as a citizen, then you would be considering. No, let's say I'm not going to the United States. I, I don't care about the United States. I just want to war with North Korea, and you decide to go and become a North Korean citizen. No, 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 not become a North Korean citizen. I just want to. I just want to stop being a Canadian citizen. Okay, so where are you going to go? I haven't decided. Yet. I'm just renouncing my Canadian citizenship well, today. He's, well, he's going to a third country. He's not going to the U.S. He's not going to Canada. He's going to Switzerland. He's moving there with his wife because she got a great job there. I'm just so disappointed with Trudeau, and I'm like, fuck this yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not a Canadian citizen anymore. He's going to renounce Islam, right. and he's going to uh, sorry. He's going to renounce his Canadian citizenship. Go to Switzerland. He's not a fan of the U.S. either. He's not taking sides in the war. Yeah. Okay. So you're still very anachronistic here because that's not the case back then. I mean, I mean, literally, when the Islamic polity existed, like came into existence, the first people to come after them were the Byzantine and Persian empires. Like they didn't like spare any time. Like they literally were like, okay, let's just wipe these people out. I mean, there was like, the con the war had already started before they even marched anywhere. Yeah. So, so, so you're, said, saying, said, it, so well, you're saying that it, it would be okay to kill me if my Canadian citizenship meant that I'm taking the enemy side. Yeah. So in the empire, if in the Islamic it would be empire, considered treason is, is what okay. So in the Islamic empire side uh, time, right? If we had an Islamic empire, uh, is nobody capable of looking, reading the Quran, and saying, "Okay, I don't believe in this," without actually taking the enemy side? It happened during the time prior to the Medinee state being established. Yeah, I mean, he allowed them to go. It was fine. No, no, like this. Okay, so basically, but uh, but you're just saying that me just saying I'm not a Muslim doesn't necessarily mean I'm taking the enemy side. I just read your freaking book and I think like this is ridiculous and I don't believe in it. I don't care about your enemy. I don't care about you. I just don't believe in this. Why would you say I committed treason just because I don't believe in this? And you're saying in an Islamic empire situation, me saying I don't believe in this book is the same as treason? Yeah. Because but why? Like we do today. What? 
because their identity was very much tied to their politics. I mean, there's no, there's, you can't separate it like today. It doesn't exist. No, I mean, what, what do you mean? Even, uh, even in the Islamic Empire time, there are a lot of people in within the Islamic community that doubted the Quran or rejected the Quran without actually taking the enemy's side. Yeah, prior to the establishment of the state. Like when? When is this? You're talking about prior the. the Sorry, what? Prior to the real establishment of the Menonite period. But also after it, after I mean, after the. Um, it's hmm? very rare. I mean, the thing is, look. No, for example, I mean, even during I brought this up in a previous conversation with you as well. Hmm. Even the Roman Empire prior to the establishment of Christianity, persecuted the Jews and the Christians um, as a result of their lacking belief in the polytheistic God because they assumed there was a political dimension to that. Well, that's, that doesn't make it okay. They, they, they're, well, they're it, does, it, it, it's, it's, it makes sense because if you think about the context in which they live, that doesn't make perfect sense. No, I mean, so it just I, because the empire did that doesn't second. make it okay, though. Like, they all, they, I mean, and, uh, uh, empires doing something makes it okay? Well, they're in this, that's the context in which they live. What other options do they have? Yeah, well, not well, to I kill mean, your citizens because they change their opinions. That's an option. It's not just changing your opinion back then. Though. That's that's what you're assuming by based on. No, but Islam, Islam itself keeps on suggesting that this is a religion. You know, you, it's not based on identity. It's based on belief. It's based on the shahada. It's based on believing yeah. in the Quran. It doesn't. Yeah, but uh, you know, you either reject it or I believe in it because of your because of the arguments that made it. Even when you're talking about converting to Islam, it has nothing to, about. It's not about changing uh, your citizenship or your race or your identity is this changing your beliefs that's all it is well the concept of umma is very much political but 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 okay you but you're making a political you're argument and you're saying this makes political <laughs> sense but that doesn't make it this doesn't make you killing people because of them switching even if what you're saying is true which i don't think is true it is <laughs> but i don't i don't think like saying that this makes strategic you know you the fact so, no, no, let me let, let me let me make it, let me make it like what Chinggis Khan, for example, did mm -hmm. in, in the way his empire he spread his empire. A lot of it made strategic sense. If your yeah. goal is to spread your empire, right? That doesn't make it morally right just because it makes strategic sense. He did a lot of things strategically very correctly, right? But okay. if if your end goal is to spread your empire, but not not actually caring about individual humans, yes, what you did is right. But that, you know, look, and look at his look, look at his results. He spread his empire, he defeated the Is uh, Persian Empire, the Islamic Empire, the Chinese. So just because strategically it makes sense, that doesn't mean like he's he's the greatest mass murderer of all time. Okay. We don't look at Chinggis Khan and but just because he had a good strategy, look at him as somebody that did things right. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, there's one problem I have with this argument, Asad, and that's uh, that um, whenever we say, you know, that should apostates be killed, and they're like, yeah, okay, it's in, if it's in the time of empire, and you know, we're expanding and so on, then then yes, they should be killed because all these other civilizations did it. You know, they they killed people for treason. The thing is, uh, if they were wrong for killing people for treason, I, I, to, to me, what that does is it kind of reduces. Uh, the Islam argument that okay, Islam is—it's really no different than all these other political, uh, you know, empires that existed in the past that were not divine. It's a very, very human thing. So it makes it a little bit more human for me. It makes it seem like it was more human-generated politics rather than a divine because it doesn't seem that much different from, uh, as you said, from other states that have imposed the death penalty for treason. But th that's the first thing. But the second thing is uh, one one problem with this argument is that, you know, if you, at a time of empire, like you said, you know, you had the Ahl al-Kitab, you had the people who were Christians, mm -hmm. for instance, you had people who were born, raised Christian, they were living in these Islamic states, they were paying the jizya, or they had, you know, whatever um, uh, conditions were placed upon the minorities. But then if you had a Muslim who converted to Christianity, mm -hmm. right, who accepted Islam, but then went back to Christianity, the punishment on, on him would be death. Mm -hmm. Now, you already have Christians there. It's okay to be Christian in this empire. But if a Muslim converts to Christianity, and if he leaves his religion once he's come to Islam, the punishment is death. And to me, that uh, that goes to show that it, it isn't just about <clears throat> um, treason. It isn't just about empire. It's actually about changing your belief. It's not about, because when you have regular Christians, they're okay. But if you convert from Islam to Christianity in that empire, you're killed. 
So is that about belief or is that about treason? Well, I got three points I need to respond to. Okay. So first one regarding Genghis Khan, his strategy was actually perfectly rational. Uh, how he may have implemented it was wrong in many respects. Like, for example, you know, uh, you may suggest that it's a good thing to spread human rights, but it's not exactly a good thing to bomb the crap out of other nations doing so. Um, so we can discuss the rationale or the morality behind the strategy and say it's perfectly fine, but the methodology being immoral. So I think that uh, was not an appropriate example. Uh, in regards to the um, the notion, uh, you made up two points, Ali, and I'm forgetting the first one now for some reason. I'll get yeah, the, the first one was that uh, when, when you talk about you know apostasy being the punishment for apostasy, uh, being analogous to the punishment for treason. Oh, yeah, you said uh, the human right. element in there. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, in the Quran, and even in the Quran specifically, there's actually no mention of punishment of apostates. Uh, that said, uh, it's mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in regards to when he was asked, you know, what should we do in this respect? You know, but uh, apostates are also disbelievers, or the, the stuff about disbelievers. Well, they're, they have a different status. In, in the legal text. I mean, they are you know, in the, the worst sense, of all disbelievers. Well, not necessarily. Actually, the Khawarij were considered the worst, but um, the Khawarij are by far the considered the dogs of hellfire. But the Khawarij uh, came, came after the Quran was completely written. Well, the Prophet also stated that very explicitly about them and predicted their coming, uh, said that they were the worst but of creation, it, that killing them would actually bring a reward if you killed them and spilled their blood. Uh, they're considered the worst of all creatures on the planet. Um, that's and they're Muslims, by the way. Uh, so um, let's see, where was I going to go with this? Oh yeah, so there are a lot of human elements in terms of, of the fiqh. Like for instance, offensive jihad uh, was not created based on the text itself. It was a response to the empires around it. And of course, there's going to be human elements within the religion. That's why there's fiqh in general. I mean, not every single command. Uh, throughout, you know, till the 21st century has been mentioned in the Quran, and that would be the biggest book in, in history. You know, we derive the basic principles from there, and you know, we go into specifics later. So, I mean, yeah, of course, there's going to be some human elements there. Um, uh, and uh, in regards to you, and I think it's a, a clever point that you brought up regarding apostasy within the state where Christians are, are getting the jizya. You have to understand the concept of the jizya is, is, an, is, is more of a, a tax to secure minority communities who have either waged war or would wage war against the Islamic State during that time. So when you explicitly leave the faith without that aman or, or contract of security, you're not under you're not ex, you're not already under the status of Vimy. So according to the legal scholars, it was the same. It didn't matter. But that doesn't I, answer I the question. question. Uh, sorry, but, but that doesn't answer the question. Like, like how, how is it still? Because the question was that is this is a punishment for apostasy. Echo. Is Echo. It? Yeah, no, wait for a second. It'll go away because I unmuted. But the, the question is that is a punishment for apostasy about belief or is it about treason? Because you said before that it was about treason. Yeah, now they're I both connected, though, back then. They're both conflated. They, they were never considered separate from each other. I mean, treason is people shouldn't be killed either. But, anyways. I believe you should. I, mean, I think it's perfectly. But, okay, but so here's, here's a question for you. You're saying this is okay in an Islamic empire kind of situation. Well, then ISIS. Could, ISIS We'll make the argument, well, that's what we were doing. That yeah, we, we were wrong in that respect because they're no longer in that context. I know, but you're saying that, I mean, just you, who, when you have an Islamic, when you set up your own Islamic empire, other people could tell you that your Islamic empire is not the correct one. I'm just saying, no, no, what I'm saying is that uh, ISIS, anybody, uh, there's echo. I'm not doing it. You're not. Doing it. I'm just yeah, saying, I, I mean, based it. on your argument that in an Islamic empire, if you if everybody else that you is not with you is your enemy, then it's okay to pe kill people that are not with you. Isn't that exactly what ISIS was doing? Because they said, what they, sense? hmm. What, well, I, what are you right? saying, Asad? Is that ISIS declared a caliphate? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they had a lot of people, a lot of Muslims come from all over the world, different places, and they mm -hmm. came in. They said, "Okay, this is a caliphate. This is an empire, and uh, we're going to expand." And they actually did it. They they actually incorporated a lot of the prophecies of the Hadith, the prophecy of Tabak, the prophecy of uh, the you know Syria and Levant, all all of that. They're bringing it all together. Even some political stuff like the Sykes Pico Treaty and so on. So, mm -hmm. so what they did was they they wanted to bring this together they wanted to actually have a traditional caliphate a traditional empire and they wanted to expand and take over more and more territory so 
uh, by the, what you're saying in an Islamic empire, if you are in a state of empire, which is something that, that you support, even if you don't suppose, support ISIS as a specific empire, uh, these punishments would all be valid. So what they were doing, wasn't it Islamic, considering that they... No, my argument is very clear in the sense that I said within the context of empire, just because you announce one in a, na in a world of nation states does not necessitate that the context has been met. So, for example, nothing in the Quran or the Sunnah explicitly states how the caliphate should be run in any specific way or manner. This was, like I said, part of the... Uh, so if it's not being stated, how do you know they're wrong? How do you know their caliphate was not the legitimate one? Because we're no longer in the context of empires. Is there any empire that exists today? Well, you have to start somewhere. Well, where is it? I mean, you can't wait, but they weren't yeah, even happening. That we was, they, they were like, starting to build an empire. That was their understanding. I mean, even the whole concept of offensive jihad was based on that implicit understanding. I mean, like now, I mean, as a result, for instance, a lot of Azari scholars later during the 19th, 20th century, I'm oh, sorry, the 20th century, the UN came out, right? There was a, an agreement among Azari scholars, generally speaking, that there was, well, there's, this is now a peace treaty between all, that there's no longer a state of war. So we can't go fighting anybody anymore. But, but do you see our point? Yeah. You know, do you see how you could make these, I mean, you just, first of all, you, you're saying it's obvious that these, are, these people are wrong, right? Yeah. But you could be wrong. You used to be Christian. Now you're a Muslim. You were wrong. I'm wrong, but I'm not wrong. So, <laughs> well, yeah, but you, but you so, don't know that. But either, this yeah, one, I don't. I don't know that absolutely. But I'm. Yeah. I mean, in I'm order just, for me to argue with you, in order for you to argue I, with me, we have to have confidence that we're both right. No, yeah, I'm not saying that. Stop believing what you believe. I'm just saying that you. You. Our argument is that even if you're right, our okay. what we are making the case for is that. The, um, the argument that they make is not as obviously wrong as you make it. To, if the Quran is true, if the Quran is word of God, mm -hmm. you make it seem like it's so obvious that you got it right and they yeah. got it wrong. And I'm saying that it doesn't, if the Quran is actually the direct word of God, is not as clear as you make it sound you have you actually have to make your points you have to make an argument it's easy to make the conclusions that they made based on the quran and the hadith well, if you're an idiot well they, uh, I well, mean, they, they're no, idiots no, look here here's the thing <laughs> they're idiots this is a this is a problem with the uh well, one more point before you go on go ahead. look there are christians in the united states who think the constitution establishes a christian state are they morons or is the constitution not clear Okay, so a, a different example might be a better example. Oh, no, no. Let's let's get, let's get to that uh, answer. No, that no, one. but he's making a, he, you're making an example that is that is more clear than the examples we have with Islam, because a better example might be the uh, the gun lobbies versus the anti gun ad okay. second ad amendment. the second amendment, yeah. right? right? And you know when you even if you if you clearly think that one side is right, the other side is wrong. You can see that this could have been more clear. No, because I actually, I, I'm, I think it's very clear. So for me, those people are morons. Same reason that flat earthers, I think, are stupid because they don't understand the science. I'm not going to say the science oh, is not clear. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll agree there. I mean, they're dumb. <laughs> they're just flat earthers. Dumb. That's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, here's a, here's a, here's a problem with having these kinds of conversations. I said is that I, I didn't, I've, I, I talked to a lot of, uh, of people. You know, Muslims, many of them are conservative, many of them are not. Um, and they usually say the same kind of thing. They're like, you know, well, what this person is doing, what that government is doing, what this scholar is doing, they're wrong. What I'm saying is right. And uh, th this is one of the problem with, problems with religious discourse. And this is, I think, one of the differences between science. And I know you talk about scientism a lot, but w w this is a problem between the I, uh, science and faith. The science has these objective sort of checks and balances, like falsifiability. If someone goes out and makes a, makes a scientific claim, supposing they're biased, scientists can be biased too, right? As you know, uh, they and then they make a claim. There are other scientists that can try to reproduce the experiment that they did and come up with different results and say, okay, this person's wrong. There's a way to do that. Right, you start with a hypothesis and then you follow the evidence to a conclusion. The problem with faith is that you start with a conclusion that I have the infallible word of God and the truth with me, and then you work backwards 
to find evidence that fits in with the path that would lead anybody to the conclusion that you have already come to. So when you have this kind of situation, everybody who has a different conclusion, right, is going to have a different path to it. And and you're going to think that, okay, everybody else is a moron. So the, 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 this makes the conversation very difficult. So, you know, the, the problem is that, fine, you, you think that uh, the ISIS caliphate is, if anybody, what, what would your caliphate be like? If you started a caliphate, if you had an empire, if you fought, saw the need of it, what are the criteria that would uh, have to be fulfilled for the empire to come into shape? Supposing it's defense from people attacking the Muslim Ummah, what would that attack look like? Does it involve drawing cartoons that involve blasphemers, apostates, uh, the founders of Atheist Republic? What does it look like? That would be uh, the right thing that that would not be... Uh, well, I'll, be answer the second. I'll answer your question in a moment, though. I think the first point regarding science versus faith, I think, is, is wrong. Um, I, I've studied the philosophy of science for quite some time, and I think and the concept of false viability was done away with a long time ago after Karl Popper lost the debate with Thomas Kuhn. I mean, you have variations of it within. I of, don't. Right? That is no, 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 no. I, I, mean, think, I, I, no, I think because if you say that you think that uh, it's wrong, it's. It, I mean, there, there is the okay, whole thing. Huh? It is wrong because false viability would collapse no, 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 every single theory that we have. If if everything, I mean, there's there's no possible way to. <laughs> no, then you, you're not understanding falsifiability, though. Fal falsifiability. No, no, it's a state. Okay, it, 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 let's go on. Let's move on. Okay. Think, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna. I mean, I mean, if you want, I mean, I can, please. I mean, your viewers can go watch my lecture on science and scientism. I also have more lectures and papers on that as well. I've studied the okay. subject in depth, so I mean, I'm I'm pretty well versed in the subject. So, but yeah, we'll just move on to your next question, if you wish. My version of a caliphate, to be honest, I haven't really thought about it in great detail. Uh, that said, I'm I'm pretty standard with my with my principles right now. I don't consider criticism to be of any sort of manner to be an act of war or anything like that in, the, in, in the current period. Uh, that said, you know, with the way that the secular Western countries are currently treating the Muslim world, I think that there's legitimate grievances, you know, and I think that the Muslim world does need to unite under a caliphate system to combat that because right now we're, we're getting slaughtered like, like ants. Like it's just, it's impossible to defend ourselves at this point. I mean, that's why you have so many desperate kids going out joining these groups because they have no other means. To defend and them. under that empire, um, me and Ali would either have to convert to Islam or be killed, right? Not necessarily, no. So, but you just said under an empire situation. In a imperial um, context, yeah. But we don't live in a context of empire. No, 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 no. If, you, if you manage to bring that back. Why would we bring up back a context of empires? Well, is it, isn't a khali, um, khalifa no, the same? Khalifa is not implicitly an empire or not. There's no, there's no, you know, mechanism for establishing the type of governing structure it is. I mean, you have, of course, an imam and things like this, but there's never but been any sort you, of... Using the word empire in an Islamic uh, context, even though there was, that, that wasn't really defined in Islam... Well, the, the caliphate was an empire at the time because that's all that existed at the time. Well, yeah, that's what, that's our understanding of how a caliphate how works. You're, you're doing beta by introducing a new concept of a khalifa. What if you're bringing, doing? Back, if you're bringing back, back khalifa, you have to follow the sunnah and follow the the um, the Rashidun's way. And basically, okay, so what is khalifa the, in an empire, in an empire, basically, if it was an empire, you have to bring it back and it should still be an empire. So we have to follow the moral principles and guidance therein, but we don't have to follow the structure. Like, for example, I don't have to ride a camel around just because Abu Bakr did. Yeah, actually, that's the point I make. That's why you should throw the whole thing out. But anyways, <laughs> because, <laughs> because you, you just pick and choose based on what, what was well, for that time. Right. No, th so the things that are uncomfortable, basically, are for that, for a specific context and for um, a specific time, but everything you agree with should be uh, copied and followed exactly. That's what it sounds like. The Quran is a book of moral guidance. I don't think camel writing has anything to do with morals. But no, I'm no, not. Well, please explain if you no, wish. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying, for example, if there's, a, if there's a story in the Quran and it's lovey-dovey and rainbow and butterflies, it's obviously a message for all people at all times. I but accept everything. It, but if it's, if it's killing people and... De and, and I accept that too. Wait, let me, let me finish. Uh, then it's all of a sudden for by peaceful Muslims, quote, uh, they will say, okay, now that's specific for a, situa for a specific situation at a certain time. But anyways, for, for during the... Uh, so basically, 
You're saying until the 1920s, before the Ottoman Empire was c collapsed, right? The final, until one of the final 19 empires. What? One of the last empires to exist. One of the last, uh, until, right until that point, um, it was okay to kill ex-Muslims. And then after that, it was. Is that well, what you're saying? Yeah. yeah? I mean, everyone had the same, almost everyone had blasphemy laws as well. You're, you're judging God based on the standard of everyone else? No. Okay. But it seems like that's what you're doing. I, I think you're, 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 the idea, we're not, okay. uh, so that this is a, this is another sort of thing that we run into is that, um, you say something about the Quran, for instance, you know, you say, okay, there's a lot of violence in here, you know, we're talking about it. You're like, well, the, uh, well, so does the Old Testament, so does the Torah, so does the, the New Testament. It promises eternal violence in the afterlife. And and uh, that's the argument. And and my response to that is I, I agree with you. I, I, I'm i not saying that those books are right and yours is wrong. This is an anti-Islam and pro Judeo Christian thing. I, I'm talking about everything. And it, it, it's the same case in this. Like, well, let know, me make it clear. I'm sorry. I, I know where you're going with this. So I just want to yeah. make it real quickly. I'm not making an uh, argument of what about it. I'm putting it into context. And what I mean by that is that uh, responses have to be judged by the surroundings. That's all you, I mean, you can't, you can't, you have to respond accordingly to what is around you. You can't just always react the same way in every situation. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I can't think of a scenario where it's okay to kill people because they change their opinions, because uh, changing their opinions could mean that they're changing the side of the enemy. I, I mean, it's just, you're saying because it was so ingrained with their identity. Well, well then why don't you just say that? Why didn't you say like, if you go betray the country and treason and then take the side of the enemy, instead of just saying, if you change your, because even then I'm pretty sure you could find examples of people that read the book and uh, that, I mean, it was, it was happening. We have lots of quotes of people in Baghdad, uh, uh, scholars and scientists that read the Quran and called it absolute bullshit. It, it happened at that time. Uh, a lot, a lot of people doing the time of Muhammad, even that, even Abu Bakr, as people in, in Medina came to Abu Bakr and like, do you really think he did flew to heaven? And uh, you know, like, do you, honestly, do you think that? So people doubt these things. That that doesn't mean that they took the side of the enemy. I mean, it just seems like if if that's what you meant, if you meant that you betray, I mean, I don't really think betraying the country does mean that you have to be killed. But if, if, even if that, even if that's what it meant, it could have just said that. And so you're saying that the context needs to be explicit to everyone? Well, if you want to avoid killing innocent people. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah actually, yeah, I, yeah. I think it should be. Here's the problem. Like, I, I, I don't think, um, oh, man, uh, how do I explain it? So, so the, the thing is that everything is, um, when we talk about faith and we talk about scripture, it's just like, well, I, should it be explicit to everybody? Well, it's, it's not going to be explicit to everybody. There's always an out. It seems like there's an, you know, this is what I was saying about falsifiability. Look, my answer to, to that whole thing about, you know, science where the falsifiability is dead. Yes, it's, th there's the idea of whether falsifiability should be expanded into. Let's um, not go into science discussion. Though. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's a matter of, you know, what the limits and the parameters of testability are and how far they should be spent. So there is a, there's a nuance to that. There's a, the, the, the idea has evolved over time. And I, I guess I want to ask you is that, you know, when you say very, uh, when you say in an imperial time, yes, this is how it should be. Yes, that's how, how it should be. It's, uh, do you ever um, read this, read the scripture and consider disagreeing with part of it or apply skepticism to it or apply any kind of nuance to it? Or do you, is your mindset usually... I'm reading the word of God. I'm reading that this is, this is divine word. Okay. This, this is what I'm doing. So I have to start with the assumption that this is true. And then later on, the analysis has to fit within that context of, okay, it's true. So now how do I sort of uh, make sense of this? But, but do you have doubts when you read it? Do you, Doubts? I have a discussion with it in my mind to determine. Or, or actually, actually, let me, let me frame that question differently. Do you find a conflict? Do you ever find any conflict between uh, what is permissible and not, or what is sinful and not, or you know, uh, uh, what what the Quran says is right or not, versus your own inherent sort of moral sense or ethical sense of what is right and wrong? Yeah, I think that the, of course, when you come to the text for the first time, there's going to be doubts and considerations because you have to. You're coming from a particular paradigm. So, for example, you mentioned in your book as well that you know people are raised in a certain societal context, so they kind of interpret things that way based on their own moral principles. 
So of course, there's going to be some conflict there as well. Uh, yeah. But when I studied things, you know, I, I found the answers. I was perfectly content with that. I, I want to get to the other point real quick because I, I don't want to really pass it up. But I wanted to give an example of sort of implicit clauses. Uh, sometimes, when, especially when we're communicating with people, we don't ever have to be explicit with many things. It's usually implied in many things. For example, so uh, let me give you, once again, let's go to the Constitution, not the Con- Declaration of Independence. I like this document. Okay. Yeah, let's go. You know, uh, all men are created equal. Uh, that's a very lovely statement. But back when it was first uttered, it didn't mean what it means to us today. Um, I don't think it's true either. Well, I mean, then we'll, we can we can discuss that too. You know, all men are created equal, right? So, but you know, back then it meant white landowners, right? Basically, that was yeah. it. But you know, today people don't understand that because they don't read the history, so they didn't understand the implicit context behind the statement. Um, but you know, I think that if you study it, it's very obvious. Mm-hmm. That, that that's fine. Uh, but I again, like the Constitution, everybody knows. Even though I know a lot of people in, in the U.S. treat it like it's scripture. But we, we know it's not scripture. We know that it was written by the founding fathers. We know that Thomas Jefferson, like, I'll give you an example. Thomas Jefferson, you know, we, we know he was a slave owner. We know that he uh, had sex with this 14 year old slave. And we know he had kids with her and all of that stuff. Okay. And these are the same things that are, are said about Muhammad, right? And that, that actually Muhammad did. So now the problem is that when people, you ask people that about Thomas Jefferson, they, they say, yeah, you know, but we give him a pass because it was the context of that time. But what he did was wrong. But if Thomas Jefferson said that, you know, all of these words that I'm writing, Declaration of Independence, everything that I'm doing here is uh, divine and it's unquestionable and it's infallible and all of my actions are to be emulated for all time. And now, you know, there are people walking around saying, justifying his uh, sex with Sally Hemings, his slave, um, then that you'd have, it would be an entirely different conversation. So, the, again, the Constitution was written by human beings and Whenever we talk about the Quran and interpretation of the Quran, uh, you know, I, especially with uh, American Muslims, I find that they go back and they start talking about interpretation of the Constitution and how the Second Amendment is vague. Like, well, that was written by human beings in the 1700s. It's a very different situation than when you're making a claim that this was written by the creator of the universe, the guy who created the binary pulsars and a hundred billion galaxies and, yes. and uh, time dilation. And it would be a huge improvement if you could have amendments to the Quran. Why, why, why is the creator of uh, uh, space time, you know, bending with it when there's increased gravitational force and all of these amazingly complex ideas that we're only scratching the surface of right now, care about who you're fighting in a war against in a war and how to treat people who don't believe that you you know the same stuff that you do or what you eat like what do you eat pork or you know whether you're having sex in front of three witnesses or four why is the creator of the universe who created uh quantum mechanics and and subatomic particles that pop in and out of existence and go backwards in time and why would this creator of the universe care um, how many witnesses you have to your adultery? Like, is, is that something? Do you ever feel like it's too narrow? Seems like, more political rather than something that. Uh, that's what I'm saying. You admit it is it's political rather than something that seems like it actually comes from the creator of the universe. Well, I mean, of course, the creator of the universe is going to talk about everything. So, I mean, he's got to talk about politics. The and that's part of our moral moral principles is is our how we pl- how we govern ourselves, right? So that has but, to be, it, right? but but the, now, the point is that it looks very much like it was just a political text or a text no, excusing no. Muhammad's actions, not like not anything like when the, the the way Ali describes the creator of the universe, like any text from if if it's actually the creator of the universe. I mean, it, it could have been this could have been so much better. I mean, I think the three of us could come up with a better document. Well, that the okay, court. let me ask you a question. Right. We we'll go back to the context discussion because that's important. You want everything, every context, everything to be contextualized to the point where it is so explicit that every single word. No, 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 don't put it. No, 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 no. I'll I'll say yes, why not? No, but but, no, 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 I know where you're going with it because then every, then the definition, your definitions have to have definitions. Exactly. Then Then you lost it. And it regress. I well, okay, that's a ridiculous standard. But I'm saying, you at least make the standard as high as what you expect from a government document or a contract or the UN making well, I think a statement. It's very explicit. I don't think I don't think there's an issue. Really, when you say spread corruption and you have like you have to crucify the people that spread corruption and you have no, you don't define what the fuck you mean by spreading corruption. Oh, it's you very think that's right? 
What is it? Okay. How is it? I mean, I know, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, so can you say that again? Well, it's very clear. I mean, for, for example, we have a hadith that mentions the reason for its, for its revelation. Well, hadith with many Muslims don't agree with. Okay, but, well, but what, no, no, that, but that's okay. What, what, is the, what is the definition of corruption in the hadith? Well, for example, for instance, when it was revealed, uh, individuals came asking the Prophet for you know, food and provisions and things like this. And eventually went out and slaughtered not only the animals, but the person tending to them. And then that reverse was revealed about that individual. It's very explicit in regards to violence. It has nothing to do with any ambiguous you know, meaning. Oh, okay, so when, if, if first of all, it doesn't, it doesn't, it it doesn't explicitly refer to violence. Mm. It just says corruption, so it's not explicit. You could, have said you, you could say well, that it implicitly refers well, to violence. Corruption because it was revealed based on that event. So, I mean, it's very much it there. C- wouldn't, okay, how, here's a simple question. Wouldn't it be an improvement if it just said violence instead of corruption? Wouldn't well, that be an improvement? Say, what do you mean by violence? No, okay, but wouldn't I, let's. I'm not saying. No, it, it, I'm not asking. I'm not asking you if it would be perfect. I'm just saying, asking you, wouldn't that be an improvement? Why? Because it would be a little bit more clear. It doesn't seem like it because you're even questioning what innocent means. That seems very clear to me. I'm not saying no, I, actually. The, I'm just saying it would be more clear. No, I'm not saying it would be absolutely clear, but it would. It would. The, the circle of the possibilities of spreading corruption. What spreading corruption could be mean? It would be a little bit smaller if you would use the wording that was a little bit more precise about who am I supposed to crucify? Or we could just use our brains five more seconds. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that doesn't. Brains for more seconds. Uh, th- th- this is the problem. The problem is that. Hey. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to do the first zinger in this podcast. Mm-hmm. The problem is when you use your brain too much when it comes to this stuff, Asad, you end up like me and Armin. <laughs> That's what the problem is. So no, no but, but here and this is the one thing that I I get asked all the time. I remember my sister asked me a couple yeah. of years ago. She said that if you die and you find That's out definitely. that it's all real and you're in front of a line, turns out it's all real, and he asks you. What what's gonna happen? Aren't you scared of that? And I I told her at the time. I'm like, why? Well, I'm one hundred percent confident that if that happens, I'm going to heaven. I'm not a hundred percent confident about anything else because I'm an atheist. But I'm a hundred percent confident that I'm going to heaven because I didn't live my life in a way that no, I harmed you. God could be evil. You don't. God doesn't necessarily. God, well, I mean, God, but, God cannot be. He but, cannot be dumber than me. Okay, if, he if could I be a sadist. A... But anyways, I, 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 <laughs> I he could be a very smart sadist. Um, yeah. said, uh, Rahman or Rahim is uh, yeah okay. Well, he's anyways. lying. Anyways, um, you you saying that if it, you keep mentioning that if idiots read it like this, right? Mm-hmm. But for you, isn't it? It's obvious that God is real, right? Yeah. And it's obvious that Islam is the right religion. Yeah. Right. So that makes Ali and I idiots. Well, it makes you ignorant of what I'm talking. Idiots. About. It's up. We're idiots. If if you're right, yeah, you're putting them on the start spot. That's no, not- no, no. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to make you call us idiots. I'm trying to say that you yourself used to be Christian, mm-hmm. and given how obvious it is to you that Islam is a true religion, you were an idiot at some point, right? Yeah, sure. So it seems like being an idiot is not very a harsh thing to be like it seems to be very common it seems to oh, be no, natural no, our brain take the word back i'm just We're saying it back. seems like given that we have faulty brains given that we have we are not gods we're not all knowing we make mistakes we could come up to wrong conclusions given that you think me and ali are complete being idiots given that you think you yourself used to be an idiot um it doesn't seem like it, and given that how much it seems to be common for people to be idiots, no, do, it don't you think it's not? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, okay. So here, here's the thing. No, Look, what I'm saying I said, is, that, you're, what I'm saying uh, is that this book should have been written to be idiot proof. Yeah, I, I th- I, beyond that, beyond that, uh, apart from that, I said I want to bring home one point, and, and this again is something that I always and and I I'm going to be honest here. I'm a little disappointed. Right in the in the way that this uh, conversation is now going, mm. is that Why? because it, it's a so, so whenever this happens, this happens with the arguments. Like you, you are pursuing your PhD in Islamic studies, right? You've done multiple degrees in philosophy of science and Islamic philosophy and Western philosophy, all of this other stuff that you've done. You've read so much, um, and you know when I say, okay, what about these other people who look at something differently? And if your answer is, well, they're just idiots. 
that to me, I, I, coming from somebody who's who's so educated and who knows so much and who studied a lot, that that's a that disturbs me. Like I, I would hope that even if you do think that there is, honestly, like I, there are times when I think. Uh, when if if someone believes that you know okay a virgin gave birth or a man flew up to heaven on a wind winged horse even if it's metaphorical or if you know all of these things they people who live the you know Jonah you know Eunice lived inside a whale I mean that that stuff to me sounds idiotic too right yeah. but I do try to understand why they believe it I you've read my book so you know that in my book I have tried to sympathize with people like my aunt who was very religious whose daughter died and and why they chose to believe these things so. Even if you do think that they're they're not, I, I, can you, would you wouldn't you at least try and consider other points of view and say okay? I have, I have, I have more nuanced position here. I'm just being very concise because we were talking about interpretation in terms of actually reading. The no, oh, there's a difference between being concise and just saying okay, this is something. To me, it seems a little lazy, right? That you're like no, okay, I, well, I to be more specific. It's really read. easy to say that okay, they're just idiots. It's like it's not. There's no effort involved in that. Well, if you want, I can say that, you know, for instance, there's a lack of reading comprehension, intellectual laziness. You know, I think so, there's a lot sorry, of, I'm sorry, can you, can you bring your mic closer? I, I can hear that. Like, for example, I mean, after other issues, like, for instance, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with lack of reading comprehension, lack of education in certain respects, or lack of, uh, or, in, or intellectual laziness even in many respects. When approaching a particular text, I feel that, yes, if you don't understand the Quran, there's an issue, there's a problem. Now, if you're just somebody minding your own business, you never heard of Islam, and you're just of it, then I'm not going to sit here and condemn you for that. But if I think that if you're reading it and you, and you can't understand, for instance, like your evasion of 68 through 9, like that makes no sense to me. That's very explicit, extremely explicit. There's nothing getting around that. And for some reason, you still try to. And that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, yeah. the, the, the reason that it's a problem, the reason is because there's so many other things. It, actually, the, those verses are very similar to the example you gave of the Myanmar Buddhists, right? I, in a lot of words, the ways they're an aberration. Like I, I'm telling you, I'm sitting here and I'm telling you loads and loads of verses. My how, book how are they an aberration? Well, they're in the book itself. They they are in the book, but they're an aberration in the sense that that entire book is supposed to be the word of God. We're not cherry okay. picking. This is not even like Darwin's the origin of species. Like we look through it, we're like, okay, this is all the stuff that Darwin got wrong. This is later all the stuff that we've added to evolution, and and uh, these are the things that were wrong. These are the things that we fixed. <clears throat> Everything else, all of these other ideas are they they evolve with time, right? Now the problem is, but this this book is not like that. This book is it's fixed, right? It's it's uh, infallible. It is the word of God. It cannot be changed. It hasn't been changed. God Himself will protect it according to the book. So. When you have those verses that you quote, there are so many other verses that I know you don't think they are, but they're in contradiction. They contradict them. Now, you might think that, uh, does that mean I'm an idiot? If I'm seeing, I'm like, okay, there's this one verse that says that, you know, you have fornicators, last them a hundred times. There's another verse that says, okay, just keep them apart until they mend their ways. How do I fix those two? Do I use abrogation? Do I use any? And, and there are pluses and minuses to everything. There are... There's, there's, there are volumes and volumes of books written by humans, okay, scholars explaining the short book, the Quran, because this, this, this book is not clear to people. Everyone who practices it practices it differently. What you're saying is very different from other people who are some of them who are much, much more knowledgeable than you and who've studied much, much longer and much, much more in depth than you, who have completely different ideas than, than what you do, right? So. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, they're right, you're wrong or anything. I'm just saying that I, I don't think that you can say, okay, well, they're wrong, I'm right, they're all idiots. Sure I can, right? because you're doing it right now. Who, no, I'm he's what? not doing that. He's, I'm not doing that. He's suggesting that, he's suggesting that it's not as clear as you're making it sound like. Because yeah, but this is what we're disagreeing about. I don't agree with you. So you are saying that? I'm, yeah, right? but you Why? can't. Just, How? You have to. You have to go beyond that. Uh, more than just saying I don't agree with you. You have to say why you don't agree with. Okay, you. that's what I listen. I, I I already I already told you that I think that a lot of these other people are wrong. I think the virgin births and all that stuff. I told you that that's how I think. But I do try and understand where that's coming from. If you ask me about that, right? If you're like a non-Muslim, you're asking me, you're like, hey, listen, you come from a Muslim family. I know you're an atheist, but whatever. But why do they believe in this virgin birth stuff? You know, why do they believe in this? Why do they? I would sit down. and I'd tell you where those beliefs came from. I, I tell you why they think, I tell you why I don't agree with them, okay. right? And I, I would say, but I, I wouldn't say that, okay, these people, I, I'd say that because they were born into those families and 
when you're born into something, I mean, this is just a regional thing. Most people, and you're, if you know that you're an exception. Con- converts are, are a huge exception when it comes to the vast majority of, of, of the Muslim population in the world. And people, most people are Muslim because they, their parents happen to be Muslim. So they conflate the ideology of Islam with the identity of being Muslim. And they, they take it, it becomes part of their, uh, the, who they are. Right? And they barely know anything about the religion. So it, I, I would explain that. And I think that that's a real phenomenon. And I, I don't think that's something that can be dismissed as I, all of them just being idiots. Well, right? I think so there, I'm I actually, think there is a measure of understanding. And I think that, yes, there is a measure of understanding that needs to be had. That's why we're having a discussion. But I'm going to be very blunt when I say that there's a lack of good comprehension. It's very obvious to me. I can't sit here and just say, no, I'm sorry. You know, I, I kind of understand where you're coming from. I don't. Right. Just, like, I don't understand why a flat earther thinks that we're really flat. I don't. I think they're, I think they're being extremely wrong. And I think I, they really uh, misunderstand science. Okay, that's, that's there's objective evidence. There's objective evidence. There's no that, objective. I, You've never been up there and seen it. It's only based on theory. Or based the on definition, the, the, the peripherals. The so, definition of corruption in verse 532, uh, Surah 5 verse 32, is not as explicit as the fact that the earth is round. That's well, it's, I mean, explicit. It, it's not explicit. that explicit. If you, no, there, if you look at the, the word corruption, it's just not. It's, it's not I, mean, I don't know how to explain it to you. I understand why it was revealed. It's very explicit. All right, but uh, let's say it's explicit. Well, that verse let's was actually revealed. Ex- but, it, okay. was about, it was about Adam and uh, Eve and about Cain and Abel and the murder that happened between them, and that was the violence that uh, it was referring to. Okay. And again, it's also in the I oral said, if you were If you were God, okay, know. and you know people <laughs> were, and you knew people were... <laughs> so I don't know there. Huh? I can't help you there, man. I don't know what you, <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna, you, I just made you God. And, oh. <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, because you're God, you know people are idiots, and you know that if the book comes and people say that this is a book by God, a lot of people are going to follow it. And because a lot of people are idiots, if you tell people to crucify people that are spreading corruption, a lot of people are going to get crucified because of very different different things. You know, you know that you know that you say, okay, this book is not. I didn't write it write it just for idiots, uh, but you know the, the consequences of the book that you're writing. You know what's going to happen when you yeah. tell people to crucify people if they're going to spread corruption, right? So, given that you know the consequences of that, why wouldn't you try to make it a little bit more idiot friendly? Well, why does he need to care to that extent? Why does he need to care that people are suffering from being crucified? Well, yes, of course, Quran as well. It says that uh, he will be making a, a, a creature that will shed bloodshed on the earth. And he knows, and uh, the angels asked him why, and he said, I know what you do. So he doesn't need to care that everybody understands this, but he does need to care if you're eating pork or you're having sex in front of three witnesses in front of, Ooh, instead of people four. People want to follow it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, I have a, I have another question. Do you, um, do you if if all of this makes sense, if as you say, if you think about it for five seconds, it makes absolute sense. Then why do you even need the Quran? Why can't you just think about it and come to the same conclusions? Well, we have the fitra in many respects. We have the what? Fitra in many respects. We have a natural. No, but why do you? If all of these things are so obviously, so it's not written for idiots because you, it's not written for people that are not already smart enough to understand this. It's if about it's intelligence. Written, it's about lack of reading comprehension. But I'm just saying, if if you read it and it it seems like everything that it says ab- agrees with your moral compass, wasn't your moral compass good enough? Well, everyone has an implicit nature towards what is good. So, so do, when you read the Quran, are uh, there stuff in there that you disagree with, but you say, "Well, I, I, Allah knows better," but you completely disagree with? If it was up to you, what would I disagree with? Is I'm asking you if there's if there are anything in the Quran that you read it and you say, okay, this makes no sense to me, but I trust it because it's Allah. <coughs> nothing I'm aware of. I haven't really nothing. Nothing in the moral sphere. I mean, there are things in there like Aleph, you know, the, the letters. The Quran, Aleph Lam Bim. Yeah, yeah that's that's something something. I don't know what that is, but you know, I can. I'm pretty clear about what the moral implications are. Right. Okay, we have to wrap this up. So I'm going to ask one last question. So, given that you were a Christian and then turned into Muslim, do you think that if this, if there was a Christian empire, it would be morally acceptable for them to kill you because you left Christianity? Yep, it would be morally acceptable. Yeah. Okay. I have a lot more questions, but I think we uh, at least we think we're running out of time. Yeah, uh, we're we're at two hours I now. I want to so be very clear about something here. Uh-huh. Okay. 
because you guys warned me in advance. You said disclaimer. I could be blunt if I wanted to be. Yes, go so, ahead. But I, I want to. But I want to be clear here that I do consider you guys very intelligent. I don't. I think you're very wrong. I think you do lack certain things that that necessary to understand the Quran. But I'm not because I don't. I don't hate you. I'm sorry. I know you. You may think that way, but I don't. I, no, I, no, no, no. We, we, we don't. Did think we that let that the, we did, did we make it seem like we hate you? No, I mean you guys. I know you're offended, and I apologize. So I do. I did mean. I didn't mean I, to no, be like no, that no. abrasive. But, you no, know, like, actually, actually, no, no. See, I said I'm not offended. This is, this is just how we talk. Okay, I was cool. talking I'm, to you. No, I, no, no. I'm not personally. I, the only time I get offended, and I, I say this online all the time, the only time I ever get offended is someone says something about my family or you know something okay, like that. Well, I want to be clear that I do feel a little guilty saying idiot because you did seem a little offended. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. No, no, no. I, I don't <laughs> think I don't think you're calling me an idiot. I was okay. talking. About the way that we have the discourse, yeah, I just so, throw and, it out there. You know, I just throw it up. Yeah, and and the reason, just to clarify, uh, the the reason I brought that up is because uh, this is something that I, I a lot of times I've had debates and I've had conversations with uh, Islamic scholars, and not just Islamic scholars, but religious scholars, and often who have you know PhDs and who are, who have uh, who are training fellows who are doing all these other things, and uh, ultimately at some point it just comes down to well, you know, those people are just idiots and and they're wrong you know and uh well, so that, that's the only reason they're frustrated and i think sometimes you know there, there is a, a way you can kind of say well you know, when, when they get to that point it's like they don't really have an answer i understand where you're coming from in respect. I've, I've seen it from people so, the other side as well and i've been discussing oh i, I actually have I, i'll tell you i've seen that on the atheist side as well yeah. i have so, i definitely have I seen say, if i want to be you know to wrap it up i apologize sure but i want to say like basically like there's a point in my opinion in my understanding of it that there has to be a point where you have to blame the individual. There has to be. You can't always go for the text. There has to be a point where you have to say, is there something wrong with my understanding? You, you see what I'm saying? That's all I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So that's I, what I, I agree with you on that. I we agree. can disagree about what the parameters are and what limitations are, but I think that there has to be a point. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think, I think the context in which... Uh, I mean, we may disagree on the context, but I, I I do agree that there has to be time when you do blame. Uh, do, you, the individual. do you think we were fair to you, or do you think we? Were well, I think you guys were awesome, and I would love to have a discussion with you again if you permit me to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> why, why wouldn't? Uh, listen, we're fine. This is how this is how we do it. It's okay. I love it has to be open. Yeah, like when I was in philosophy courses, man, I used to have debates all the time. It's great. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, so that's that's what we do. This you can't. I, I've always found it uh, strange that you know people who do this kind of work, the kind of work that we do, or write books like I do, or write books like Armin has. You know, when uh, people do that, and they're kind of in a way. I mean, they're not intentional provocateurs, but the topics that they're talking about are the top politics and religion, the things you're not supposed to discuss at work for very good reason. So, if you're in that, you're well, you're used okay, to it. It's okay to be. To it's, okay, yeah. it's okay to be pro provoke as long as you're not provoking just for the sake of provoking. Yeah, yeah. We uh, like, you guys, like I love you guys in terms of this having these discussions. I really appreciate you guys having. I really appreciate you having these discourses because I'm having a hard time finding ex Muslims to talk to. Mm -hmm. right, frankly. And I, and I know there's there's reasons for that, some legitimate, but some not. And you know, you guys give me this opportunity, I think it's really helpful for everyone. Yeah. Oh, I, no, I, oh, after that, Ali, at, uh, let's ask him where people can find him and where could follow him. As yeah, I do. I, I, I just want to conclude. I, uh, thank you for coming here. I know there's two of us and there's one of you. So we, we've been like bombarding you. We've been trying to like dig stuff <laughs> out of you. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for for coming here, we we resolved at the beginning of this year uh, when we named the secular jihadists from Muslim enlightenment that we wanted to talk to more people, um, more Muslims as well, because you know we don't want this to turn into an echo chamber. I think that we're at the point right now with this whole movement, and there's so much dialogue out there that that we need to start um, talking with each other. So I, I'm really really happy that you came on. I'm really glad you came on. I, I really enjoyed your discussion with Armin that you had before on the Atheist Republic podcast. If you guys. Listening, you can check that out too. So, and okay. I appreciate your willingness to engage. I, I think it's uh, there. There are people at my talks. Often, I get Muslims coming in asking me questions. Sometimes they're more combative, and I, I always appreciate the fact that they came in and they were willing to engage because I think that we, that we need more of that and less less. Uh, you know, even if we disagree vehemently. Yeah, and I think it's great. Armin. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with Ali. The more we talk, the less we fight. Um, but um, I mean, I, I mentioned this last time also when, in our last discussion that even if we don't change each other's opinions, if we 
disagree, openly disagree, openly fight against each other's ideas and yet not take, make it personal. Even if we don't change any, each other's opinions, we have already won because a lot of people think that it's impossible for people to have such passionate disagreements without getting along. But by doing, by demonstrating that this is possible, we're already proving these other people wrong, right? So when we have these discussions, because the extreme on both sides, they don't want this. The extremes on all sides, they want our disagreements to lead to hatred. If we can demonstrate that our disagreements doesn't have to necessarily lead to hatred, that, uh, you know, we're proving them wrong, whether or not we change each other's opinions. Um, but on that note, where can people, if people are interested in asking you questions or if people became a fan because of this and want to follow your work and go check out your website or your research or uh, where, where can they find you? And by the way, we'll link to, once the non-live version of this is out, we'll link to all of that in the description of wherever you're listening to this to. You can check out my YouTube channel and also my website where I have all my social media stuff, asadullahani.com, very simple. Say that again. Uh, AsadullahAli.com, just my uh, dot com. So there okay. you can find the Andalusian Project, my YouTube channel, things like this. And you can discover for yourself what I believe and, and what I don't believe, etc. And, uh, you know, one last statement before you guys get off. Um, uh, you know, from one jihadi to another. You know, <laughs> let's, continue, let's continue this jihad. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm totally, totally in solidarity with you on that. And, and, and when, if we, you know, we'd like to have you back at some point in the future. And when we do, I'd, I'd love to get into that, uh, the science and scientism thing that you talk about because, because uh, I was kind of itching to dive into that, but I didn't want to go off topic. But maybe next time. Right, but yeah. wait, stay online. But before uh, I'm gonna go off um, off air, but stay on the hangouts for just a few more seconds. But, um, um, uh, so, guys, on the live chat, thank you so much. Sorry, we did because Ali and I had so many questions. I went through some of the questions. I couldn't go through all of them. I know a lot of you had so, so many good points that I didn't bring up. Uh, if you're a Patreon, we will go to our Facebook uh, group that we have for patrons. We're going to bring, uh, we're going to discuss this video and we're going to bring up all the questions that brought up was you have over there as well. So there's a, so check out if you don't have the link to the f uh, f Facebook group for patrons, ask me for it and I'll send it to you. Yeah. Um, and so on to Souza, I'm going to prioritize the questions next time because I know you asked a few and they're really, really good. Yeah, and Jim uh, was asked a question. Mike asked questions. God asked questions, but there, there are some very good points. I actually cheated on. And actually use some of their points anyways anyway so i'm gonna go off her thank you guys for 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 being here i'm gonna and goodbye thank you bye-bye the secular jihadists have been made possible thanks to the illuminati and the covert support of israel and the cia that's what we have been told but we haven't received our checks yet if you like what we do please support us share the podcast with your friends write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.